Welcome to the Conference for Digital Hope. I'm Dorothy Alston Colley, the Chair of the Communication Studies Department at Biola University. My name is Dr. Tim Yohoff. I'm a professor at Biola University in our Communication Department. Welcome so much. Thank you for taking an afternoon to be with us, those of you that are live streaming it. Think about it. In a time in which Americans can't agree on anything, 98% of us agree on one thing, that incivility is threatening the very fabric of our country. 65% believe we've already hit crisis levels in this country, and 42% believe it is not safe for me to share my perspective, either online or in person. What can we do about these devastating statistics? Why have we become more uncivil? A favorite target has become the internet. It's social media that fuels our anger. By now, all of us have heard terms like disinhibition, where people feel free to say things online that they would never say in person. In light of such hostility, it's easy to see why many simply want to leave online communication altogether. Recently, Caitlin Flanagan wrote in The Atlantic that we really need to quit Twitter. In her essay, Flanagan examines how Twitter destroyed her ability for private thought and her enjoyment of reading. She had become more distracted, impatient, and even a little bit harsher in her communication. So now she's done, and she is not alone. Political voices like Andrew Sullivan and well-known celebrities like Chrissy Teigen have joined the exodus away from social media. How should Christians respond? Should we join the exodus? On one hand, that makes sense. Think of all the prohibitions in scripture about slander and clamor and bitterness, and certainly the book of Proverbs that we should not issue words of death. So on one hand, it would make sense for us to just join others and swear off Twitter or twi uh, swear off social media altogether. We're suggesting today that maybe there's a different way, that if we are to be Christ's representatives, both in face-to-face -face interaction, but also in our communication online, that we need to think long and hard both about the peril of online communication, but also its promise that we can get in and have constructive and civil conversations as we seek to share Christ's per uh, perspective. So our conference today is co-sponsored by three departments. And the first is the Department of Communication Studies at Biola University. In the Communication Studies Department, we seek to teach our students how to impact the Lord for the Lord Jesus Christ by helping them engage in critical analysis of culture, how to create culture in a winsome and ethical manner, and how to engage in deep interactional communication while also learning how to develop organizations that are powerful and healthy and can reach a common goal together. In addition to his role as professor in the Communication Studies Department, Dr. Tim Muehlhoff is also the co-director of the Winsome Conviction Project. A year ago, two generous donor couples were uh, concerned just like we are about the incivility that has seemed to saturate our communication. They graciously funded for five years what we now call the Winsome Conviction Project. Our uh, goal is to reintroduce civility, uh, perspective taking, and sympathy into our conversations on a multitude of issues. If you want to find out more about the Winsome Conviction Project, simply go to winsomeconviction.com and you can see our podcast as well as articles, blogs, and different resources to help us speak the truth but to do so in love. And our final co-sponsor for today is the School of Fine Arts and Communication. Our conference today is being put on in part as of the celebration of the media and arts. For more information about this celebration, please see biola.edu slash celebration of media and arts. But to begin our conversation today, we have Dr. Emily Sidnam Mauk, who will be sharing her research with us in a session entitled, Does Social Media Make People Meaner? understanding and navigating barriers to civility online. 
She works remotely as a research scientist for Clemson University's School of Computing, and her research investigates how and why people use social media technologies and what implications social media have for digital well-being. Her work has been published in journals like Computers and Human Behavior, Communication Research, and New Media and Society. Dr. Sidnam is also an alumna of the Communication Studies Department at Biola University and of the Tory Honors College. She's the class of 2012, and it was such a pleasure to have her as one of my own students, and she was also my TA when she was a student on campus. While at Biola, she was named the Outstanding Communication Studies Student of the Year, and she received the St. Anne's on a Hill Award from the Tory Honors College. Dr. Sidnam has earned her MA in communication from Purdue University and also has an MA and PhD in communication and journalism at the University of Southern California, where she studied new media and social networks. Her dissertation work developed a model to identify the human and technology factors which predict social media distraction behaviors and related outcomes. Dr. Sidnam and her husband, Dr. John Mauck, reside in Loma Linda, California. She is hashtag sorry not sorry that her social media feed currently showcases her two-year-old son and her four-month-old daughter. Welcome, Emily. There is nothing new under the sun. These words are written in Ecclesiastes. But a lot has changed in our technologies in the past thousand years, a couple thousand years since those words were written. So for example, our technologies for transportation have switched from the donkey to the Tesla. Our timekeeping technologies have switched from looking at the sun to looking at a smartwatch. And our communication technologies have changed from papyrus to TikTok. So is there really nothing new under the sun? In particular, social media seem to bring incivility to an unprecedented unprecedented level. In fact, there's so many rude sayings online that we've come up with terms like trolls and haters and wise sayings like never read the comments. So I've spent the past eight years studying why we use social media and what type of impacts it has on us. And I want to use some of that knowledge today to talk about three things. I'd like to talk about the role that social media play in our lives, in particular in facilitating meanness. I want to identify some barriers to civility on social media. And spoiler alert, I do actually want to show that there is nothing new under the sun by applying timeless wisdom to social media settings. So let's start by answering a question that has come across many people's minds. Are social media making us meaner? So basically, um, this term is something, uh, this idea that new technologies and communication technologies are making us meaner or ruining our relationships or having a negative impact on us is not really new. So for example, when the newspaper was invented, the print newspaper, there was this widespread fear that it was going to have a negative impact on society as people stayed at home and read their print newspapers instead of gathering together in the public square. Going even further back, Socrates expressed concern about a new technique called the alphabet, and he was afraid that it would cause people to become less intelligent as they relied on the alphabet instead of memorizing things. So thankfully, just as we've somehow found a way to incorporate the print newspaper and the alphabet into our lives, I have hope that we can also incorporate social media as well. The reason that this idea that a technology can shape us either for positive or negative ways um, unquestioningly is something that can be called technological determinism, which is this idea that technology itself is driving its outcomes on society. And a problem with this way of thinking is that it ignores the role that we play as people in how we shape technologies and how we use them. 
And so one way that we can think about social media, and I think which is a more helpful way than a technological determinist way of thinking, um, is to, um, to remember that social media are extensions of our offline world. They can be used in either positive or negative ways. So in this sense, social media are not making us meaner. They're not causing us to be more rude than we were in the past. This has always been a problem of meanness in the hearts of people. But on the other hand, it can be an error as well to think that social media have absolutely no impact on us. So instead, instead of social media making us meaner, they do present barriers to civility. And let me explain a way that we can think about this. There's a term called technological affordances, which was made popular by Don Norman. And it's this idea that tools or technologies created by humans have different affordances or different aspects of their design that can provide possibilities and constraints related to their use. So let's take a tea pouring technology, or looking at the teapot, and think about this term of affordances. So a teapot has a handle and a spout. And the handle is something that affords the act of pouring a cup of tea. And the size of the teapot can constrain how much tea can be poured. And little design changes can make it more or less useful for different things. So for example, uh, the blue teapot, in hopefully the slide that you can see, is something that could be used for pouring tea. And but let's say you're a coffee drinker instead, and you want to make a pour over. Well, that wider spout might not work as well for your pour over. So you could instead use a silver gooseneck tea kettle. And just by changing the spout a little, making it a little bit longer, a little bit thinner, can give that nice control for making that pour over that has that really nice bloom, it smells really good. Any coffee lovers uh, can maybe imagine what I'm smelling and thinking about right now. But let's look at then this third teapot in the middle, the red teapot. The simple design change of taking the handle and moving it to the other side of the teapot with a spout basically makes the tea kettle unusable. If you tried to pour tea from this pot, you would get burned. Uh, so just as technologies, the design of tools or, and physical objects can impact the way that they can be used and the outcome of their use, Social media have what we can call digital affordances. And this means that features of their design can create different possibilities for and barriers to civility. So I want to take the rest of the talk and talk about what some of these barriers look like and um, how we can navigate them. So the first set of barriers that I would like to talk about are limited social presence and anonymity. Social presence is just a fancy way to say the feeling of being there with someone. So the different ways that social media are designed can impact the feeling of being with a real person during the interaction. And this can happen on a continuum. So for example, um, Facebook offers features like a video chat, where you can talk to someone in real time, you can see their video, they can see your video, and you can hear their voice, you can see some of their body language, and this provides more of a sense of them being in the room. On the other end of the continuum, you have things like tweets or posts or comments that are mostly text-based. And these things offer very little social presence, so it's not the same as being in, in the room with that person. So a lot of our interactions online actually happen in this space of limited social presence. Let's talk about why that can be a problem for civility. So first of all, one important aspect of social presence is vocal cues and nonverbal behavior. So the way that our voice sounds, our body language. And when you have a lack of nonverbal cues, it can lead to misunderstandings and defensiveness. For example, the words good for you, when you read them in a comment, could be read as good for you or they could be read as, good for you. <laughs> so the way that you read those words in your mind is gonna have a big impact on how you respond to them. And when we have that lack of context, it can make it easier to run into misunderstandings and to get defensive online. There's also research that shows that the amount of social presence in an interaction can impact the way that we respond to people and the way that we talk. So when there's a lack of eye contact in an interaction and also when there's a lack of eye contact plus anonymity, so you don't know the 
the person doesn't know your name, it actually makes people more likely to say something rude or hostile. And so it's not that social media is making us meaner or making us say these things, but it's removing the barriers that we usually have in face-to-face -face interactions, like just remembering that someone is there, that they're a living human being, that usually keep us from uh, saying things that we'll regret. So how do we navigate these barriers of this lack of social presence online? We can navigate the barriers to civility on social media by applying timeless wisdom to the existing um, social media tools that we do have. So let's take an example. Proverbs says, watch your words and hold your tongue. You will save yourself a lot of grief. How many people have posted something that they later regretted on social media? I know that I have, and I try very, very hard not to. So this is so easy to do online, to post something that we later regret. So we can take this timeless wisdom of watching our words, and we can take it literally. One affordance of social media is that it allows us to type out our words and to have a conversation asynchronously. And asynchronously is just a fancy way to say that you can start, stop, or pick up a conversation at any time. And this can actually be a benefit to us because especially if we're in a heated argument, uh, we can stop, we can watch our words literally, we can read them, think about how we're feeling, be mindful, am I feeling angry right now? Am I anxious? Am I, you know, what, what am I feeling as I'm posting this? You can read those words out loud to yourself and listen to the tone and think about how it might come across to other people and really consider their impact. So those are some things that we can do to take advantage of the asynchronous nature of social media to apply that wisdom of watching our words. Let's talk about another barrier to civility. Another, type, another set of barriers has to do with social media's affordances or its ability to connect us with large groups of people across time and space. And these barriers come in the form of context collapse and time collapse. But before I tell you what those are, I want you to imagine something. Imagine you're sitting at your favorite you know, restaurant, you're talking to your friend, you're having this nice face-to-face -face conversation, and you look behind you and, oh no, there's a whole crowd of people watching you. There's your oh, your high school soccer coach, your best friend from third grade, that random person you met in Starbucks one time, yeah, that would be pretty weird, and you would be paying more attention to what you're saying and how you're saying it. You might even move the conversation to someplace more private. But we have these types of conversations on social media all the time. There's different people listening and looking at what we're saying online, but the difference is often we're not aware of those types of audiences. This is what we in the research world call context collapse. And this refers to how multiple audiences can merge into one setting on social media. This can also be extended to a sense of time collapse, where time is collapsed through the access to posts online that are uh, detached from their original context. So on social media, we're not only speaking to multiple different types of audiences and multiple different relationships, mo multiple different contexts at once, we're also even talking to multiple future audiences that may be in a different context by the time they read your post. These can create barriers to civility for a number of different reasons. For example, because we're connected to so many people, it can make it easier to just encounter disagreements online. There's so many more opinions and backgrounds and uh, different contexts of, of people like coworkers, friends, family, distant acquaintances that are all in the same room. And so it's, we're just gonna see many more areas for disagreement when we're online than when we're just walking around doing our everyday activities. Also, it's harder to know our audience and anticipate how they're going to react to our posts. So if you've ever posted something that you thought was un uncontroversial and then had an unintentional comment war happen on your social media, you understand how diff difficult it can be to anticipate the types of people who are listening to our conversations and how they're going to react to our communication. Lastly, it makes it more 
difficult to have nuanced conversations. And especially when we're talking about topics that are contentious or hotly debated, it's so important for civil conversation to be nuanced, to listen to other people, to try to understand where they're coming for, from, what their shared values are, and to be able to communicate our own values and thoughts in a way that is appropriate to that context. So when, we, when everyone is sort of meshed into this one setting, that becomes more difficult to do. How can we navigate this barrier? Again, we can apply timeless wisdom to the social media tools available to us. Uh, this is one of my favorite proverbs. It says, a loud and cheerful greeting early in the morning will be taken as a curse. I am not a morning person, and on top of that, I have a newborn, so I get very little sleep. If someone came to my window at two in the morning and was like, knocked on my window and said, hey, Emily, you're awesome, I hope you have a great day today, I would be like, okay, stop, you need to leave right now, I need this sleep, this is not okay, and also very creepy. Um, <laughs> so basically what Proverbs is saying is that Sometimes the delivery and context and timing of our words is more important than the intent behind them. The good intention of the blessing is negated by the fact that it was so poorly delivered. So one way that we can be wise in our social media conversations and be civil is to think about the context and timing and uh, to just be extra mindful of that because we have these added barriers. And one way that we can do this through existing social media tools is to use things like your friends or your followers lists. So what you can do is you can actually just pull up the list of people who follow you or your friends on Facebook, and every once in a while, take some time to scan through that. Think about the types of people that are following you and your relationship to them. Look back at some of your past posts. How might different people perceive the posts that you've written? Uh, are they kind and generous to everyone who is following you on social media? Another thing you can do is to avoid this sort of context collapse happening, you can use tools on social media that help you focus your audience. This is going to be especially important for topics where there's sort of inside jokes or special knowledge that you kind of need to understand what you're saying. And one thing that you can do for that is to do, you know, speak one-on-one -on -one using a direct message or a private message. There's also tools like Instagram's close friends list, Facebook's um, custom audience, and things like that. So to wrap it up, social media are not making us meaner, but their design can create barriers to civility. And we talked about a couple of those today. We can navigate these barriers by applying timeless wisdom and effective communication strategies to our social media tools. And this really, I really believe that there is nothing new under the sun. So the problems that we're seeing today are just new iterations of timeless problems of incivility in the hearts of people. But on the flip side, a positive aspect of that is that the same things that make people peacemakers offline and the same things that have made people peacemakers throughout history are the same things that can make us peacemakers online. So civility on social media is possible. And my hope for our digital future is the same as my hope for our everyday communication. It's that um, whether face-to-face -face or on social media, we will listen deeply and generously and we will speak authentically and wisely. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. What a wonderful talk. We're so happy to have you back at Biola. Welcome home. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. So I do have a couple of questions for mm -hmm. you, and then we'll see whether or not we have gotten any questions online while Sounds you've been speaking. Great. So first of all, you said that private messaging or using mm -hmm. uh, custom audience tools can help us speak to a more focused audience when necessary. Mm -hmm. Would it be better to just have one type of audience in mind on social media so we're less likely to run into those misunderstandings? <laughs> Yeah, so I think that it's definitely easier to speak to one type of audience, and it, it really is a lot of hard work to keep in mind all the different people we're talking to and to try to speak in a way that is helpful to the, the most amount of people at the same time. 
But I also think that it is important to be connected to a variety of different people on social media. Uh, so if we're only connected with the people that think like us and act like us and look like us, then we are really missing out on opportunities to learn and to grow and to take advantage of one of social media's assets, which is that it does connect us to more people and more opportunities to learn and more opportunities to grow as a person in the way that we're thinking and the way that we're communicating with others. So you talked about social media design features creating barriers to effective mm -hmm. communication. Are there any social media features that can help our communication and our relationships? Definitely. So I really strongly believe that social media is a tool that can be used well or poorly. And a lot of these social media features, you can look at them in a positive or negative light. So like I said, uh, one difficulty of context of collapse happening on social media is it's a barrier to civility. But again, it's also an opportunity for connecting with people that are, um, have different places in our lives, that we have different relationships with, that we, um, some people that we know well and some, pe some people that we don't know as well. So this can be actually an asset to us uh, if you look at it from another perspective. Also, just use, being able to connect to people across time and space can help us really deepen our close relationships too. So if you move away from someone, you can still stay connected to them on social media. It gives us more opportunities to speak positively into people's lives and to um, you know, just encourage them in a way that we couldn't do if we weren't seeing them that day face to face. So it also extends our opportunities to put positive communication into the world. So you mentioned that trolls are a bit of an extreme example of how anonymity and a lack of social presence can encourage incivility and communication. Mm -hmm. So how do we not feed the trolls? Yes, that is a great question and a hard question. I think that Proverbs, again, is really helpful here. So there's two Proverbs that sit right next to each other. One says, don't answer a fool according to their folly or else um, you'll be just like them. And the, another, the one right next to it says, answer a fool according to their folly, folly or else they're going to be wise in their own eyes. So at first like, wait, what? This is two completely different things. What am I supposed to do? But when you think about it, it's like, okay, it takes wisdom to understand um, who is going to respond well to communication, to sort of uh, being called out basically and who is not. And I think when it comes to trolls online, uh, the majority of, of true trolls, so a troll is someone who posts something inflammatory online for the purpose of getting an emotional response. So they want you to respond. No matter what you say, they're just gonna try to keep getting that emotional response from you. So in that sense, they're the one where you don't answer a fool according to their folly. It's uh, if you don't know the person, if it's especially if it's an anonymous account, it's better to use social media's reporting features, if they're, especially if they're violating community standards, and report them. And instead of feeding the troll and addressing them, reach out to the friend who had the troll say a negative comment and say, hey, you know, uh, in a private message, I saw that someone said something really derogatory on your post, and I'm really sorry. That must have felt not good. It's like, I want to say I really enjoyed what you posted. Yeah. Well, so I have one more question that's a little more personal than mm -hmm. it is uh, about your presentation. But as an alumna of the program mm -hmm. here at Biola University and your major in communication studies, how do you think uh, this program and your time here at Biola helped prepare you for both your graduate work and the work that you're doing now? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I loved my time at Biola, and I think that being part of the comm program, some of the things that I valued were uh, in the courses. First of all, I remember like, uh, Professor Colley's class on interpersonal communication and intercultural communications just helped me in my everyday life, um, and I still use concepts from them now. Dr. Muehlhoff's uh, class on communication theory was really helpful going into grad school in communication, understanding some of those core theories that are part of the field. But I think the most valuable part of my time at Biola was just how much the faculty invested in me. And I think that's really unique. So uh, for example, Dr. Todd Lewis, when he was here, he helped me prepare a paper that I submitted to the National Communication Association, which is a big uh, research conference. So I was able to present. And then Dr. Malloy helped me through that conference. Uh, Dr. Col Professor Colley also helped me prepare for my grad school application. She helped make sure that my writing sample was good to go, both um, 
both uh, Professor Colley and Dr. Muehlhoff also gave me the opportunity to TA in their class. So I had a really great um, amount of experience to put on my grad school applications. That was really helpful. And I think that's rare to see that amount of investment in someone. So if you invest in your education here, I feel like you also get invested in as well. Well, Emily, we are so proud of you and so grateful for you coming back and being a part of our community. It means so much to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce you to another one of the pivotal people who is a part of our program and department here at Biola University, Dr. Ariana Malloy. Dr. Malloy is an associate professor of organizational communication in the communication studies department here at Biola. She earned a PhD in organizational rhetoric at the University of Denver, an MA in organizational communication at the University of Portland, and a BA in rhetorical studies at Seattle Pacific University. Dr. Malloy's research focuses on meaningful work, work as calling, and the connection between humility, burnout, and the workplace. She has been published in premier journals such as the International Journal of Business Communication and Communication Studies. Her most recent publication won Article of the Year in 2019 in the Journal of Management, Spirituality, and Religion. At Biola, she teaches courses in organizational communication, research methods, nonverbal communication, small group, communication and calling, and her love for teaching is reflected in a in a variety of outstanding achievement awards, such as the Provost Award for Excellence in Teaching as the Best Teacher in 2014, and the Faculty Excellence Award. She also directs the Pedagogy Development Program at Biola University and helps develop the work of faculty here. In addition to being an active speaker in academic settings, she also works as a consultant for nonprofit organizations and a speech coach for professionals and ministries. She was part of the first ever calling retreat where she spoke on meaningful work and burnout in the time of COVID-19. Her areas of consulting expertise include strategically developing presentation skills, building a collaborative environment, increasing team success, as well as analyzing meaningful work, burnout, and preventative measures. Originally from Seattle, Washington, and happily married to Dr. Alan Ya, a professor of intercultural studies at Biola, they enjoy running half marathons, traveling the world, drinking good coffee, and their greatest adventure happened a few years ago when their family grew from two to three with the arrival of their son, Asher. At first, their cat was not so pleased, but she has since adapted to little Asher's presence. Welcome, Dr. Ariana Malloy. So a few years ago, my husband and I were traveling in Europe, and on the day that we were in Oxford, we were the goal was to, to run 11 miles because, uh, you see, at the same time, I was training for my first marathon. That's actually how my husband and I fell in love, but that's a whole other conversation. So on the day that we were in Oxford, we started running in the cobblestone streets, which takes a lot of skill, and we finally made it to the beautiful Oxford countryside. I was thrilled and it felt like my, my lungs were filled with more than just oxygen because I was literally running on the paths that C.S. Lewis and Tolkien had walked. And in fact, my eyes were actually searching the horizon like, is Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth walking in the mist somewhere? Because it just seemed so amazing. Now here's the deal. We were in such a hurry to do all the things we possibly could on this trip that we didn't even take a shower. I know that's so gross. But after our run, we hopped on a bus to London and then immediately went to Paris. The next day, we thought, we have a full schedule, but you know, we should run a maybe two or three miles just to kind of warm up. We have time, right? Have you ever thought that before where you know, you know your plate is full, you know it, but you think, I can just add this one more thing. I have time, right? So here's the problem. My body and I, we woke up stiff and sore, and it was talking to me, my body, and I was not listening. My calves felt extra tight, and I was not listening. And so I flashed to that quote that says, pain is leaf, uh, weakness leaving the body. I took a quick sip of water, I barely stretched, and I started to run. As you can imagine, this did not end well for me. So at right about the one minute mark, I felt a pop and then excruciating pain. 
And I wish I could tell you that it worked out, but it really didn't. I tried to make it through the rest of our trip, and then I ended up seeing four different orthopedic doctors and a lot of physical therapy. And throughout that year-long healing process, I kept thinking to myself, if only I had listened to my body. There were so many moments before the actual injury. There were so many small choices that if I had just listened to them, maybe, maybe things would have been different. We have to pay attention to the whispers. What I'd like to suggest to you today is that in this incredibly busy world with chaos and tragedy and, and division lulling us into participation with just a quick like, a tweet, um, a post of some kind, in order to slow down and to really pay attention about what's going on, we have got to pay attention to the whispers. Communication specialist Anderson says this about what tension and stress does to our interactions. We live in a constant state of tension between boredom and stress, between stimulation and relaxation, between maintaining privacy and avoiding loneliness. How does this relate to our online communication? As a researcher who loves to study work and calling and burnout, and I'm real passionate about the role of Sabbath in that, I think it relates pretty well. As we talk about how we should be engaging online, we have to include the role of Sabbath. Why? Why should we do this? Because communication online should not primarily be an outlet for unexamined stress. Because words matter. Because how we communicate matters. And we have to bring thoughtfulness back into the room. We have to bring thoughtfulness back into our engagement. And the only way to do that is to have space to think. And the only way to do that is to have margin in our lives, in our heart and mind. And the only way to do that is to have an attitude of Sabbath, even in the midst of really stressful times, which I know for many of us is right now. You know, the only true way I think that we can have a sense of protective and recovery uh, from sustained stress is through consistent and intentional Sabbath. Christians like to talk a lot about Sabbath. There are books and books about Sabbath, but for our time today, what I'd like to do is to talk about the connection between Sabbath, communication, and specifically online. So if you'll journey with me, what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about my journey to Sabbath because, oh, it's a story. Get ready. And then I actually want to share with you what research specialists in the communication field say what happens when we have that level of stress that goes beyond a moment but goes to chronic stress. There are actually three things that happen to our communication. And then in the end, in our time, what I'm hoping to offer you and to experience with you is a reframe of understanding Sabbath as more than just an act that's repeated maybe once a week, but it's actually an attitude of the heart that lingers with us for every day of the week. So my Sabbath aha moment happened when I experienced food poisoning twice my first year in my PhD program, you know, as all good aha moments do. I had been aware that I was experiencing stress. It was my first year in the doctorate program. I didn't know anybody, and I, um, I had some food maybe that was not the most fresh. You know, you have whatever is in your refrigerator when you don't have a lot going on. And so I had that, and all of a sudden, boom, food poisoning. Two weeks later again, Boom, food poisoning. So I'm sitting there, or really lying there on the bathroom floor, sort of pulling my carpet over me like a blanket, and I'm thinking, this is not going well. You know, right before that, the Holy Spirit had been tapping into my heart to pay attention to Sabbath, but I had tried that before, and I was kind of bored and actually more stressed when I tried to pursue Sabbath. So I thought, okay, Lord, I will give it another go. I will try to pursue Sabbath again after I finish my next project. But, you know, here I was lying on the bathroom floor, and I'm thinking, this is not going well. It is not sustainable. You know, there's that great myth that if I can just get through the next fill-in-the-blank, then I can do the healthy thing. If I can just get through the next semester, if I can just get through the next work project, if I can just get through the next holiday or family event, then I'll do the thing that's healthy for me. If I can just... So I'm bargaining with the Holy Spirit on the bathroom floor, and I felt that tap in my heart. And that tap said, if you wait until there's a good time, there will never be one. If you wait until there's a good time, there will never be one. And that's when I began thinking about Sabbath differently. I was, I was realizing that if God is the author of time, if he's in charge, then a really quick definition of Sabbath is this. Sabbath is tithing our time. Sabbath is tithing our time. I understood tithing our money. I understood that was all God's. For some reason, I hadn't translated that to time. 
Sabbath as tithing our time is a symbolic act of trusting God and being vulnerable, of releasing control and training our ear towards his voice, that he's in charge, but more than that, that he is a loving father, a beautiful, wonderful coach. He is the joy giver and the best guide and certainly the wisdom teacher. In this way, Sabbath is not simply a thing that we do. It's actually a relational act between us and the Lord. And in the case of knowing how and when, and why to respond to social media, he is that wisdom giver. So let's just take a quick review. What is wisdom? Wisdom that comes from above, and that comes from heaven, is first of all gentle and pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, willing to yield to others, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. That is wisdom. So some of you might be thinking, as I'm talking about Sabbath, because maybe you've heard some messages about this before, or maybe it's new. Some of you might be thinking, Sabbath is fine. I I actually do want to do it, but you, you don't know what is in my life right now. You don't know what's in my calendar. I seriously don't have time. And you know what? I get that. I really get that. But I humbly suggest to you that you should not wait until you have time. I suggest that you should pursue it because it will refresh your time. You, I want to clarify that, yes, it might refresh our time. I really do think it will. That's not the reason to do it. So that's a happy consequence, of course. That's a happy consequence of Sabbath. The reason to Sabbath is, of course, because we are commanded to. But let's peel that back a little bit from a communicative perspective. Who's commanding us? The Lord, our Heavenly Father, who wants relationship with us. So then it's not just a command functionally or cognitively. It's a relational invitation. So let's get back to this idea of sustained stress just for a second. So what does sustained stress do? So we throw the word stress around like we throw dirty laundry into the bin, unthinking and really all the time. Like we just say stressed all the time. And the reality is that stress itself is not bad. There's good stressors, like having a new job, a new romantic partner, an event, something you're excited about. And our bodies just naturally get stressed, and and that's okay. We can experience the good stress. The problem with stress is that we can normalize it to such a degree that we don't realize when when it's stopped being from a particular event and it's become chronic in our lives. It's become normal. And this is called chronic stress or sustained stress. And it's more than just a temporary experience of mental, physical, psychological, emotional, and spiritual fatigue. Sustained stress negatively impacts our core identity, our own ability to communicate, but also how we perceive others in their communication. How does this actually work from a communicative perspective? I'm so glad you asked. I will tell you there are three things that happen. The first thing that happens when we have sustained stress is that we have a sense of withdrawing. The first thing that happens from sustained stress is that we have a sense of withdrawing. Here's what we mean by this. So you're in a car with someone, right? There's a little bit of tension going on and you ask them, are you okay? And this might happen. They turn their shoulder, they turn their body, they cross their arms, or they might even pull out the phone. They don't look at you, but they say, I'm fine. That's withdrawing. And in fact, in today's society, we tend to use technology as the place we withdraw. Now, here's the deal. One minute, we're just sort of mildly scrolling through friends' photos of like weddings and babies and new animals. And all of a sudden, we've moved from that to doom scrolling, where we are looking for drama and lusting for tragedy. And we cannot be doing that. While some elements of withdrawal are actually um, pretty healthy, it's important to do that when you need to. If we're not careful how and when we're doing it, we can go to sources that further deplete us. So here's what I want you to do for a second. Are you with me? I want you to imagine that you are going to withdraw in a healthy way, but your technology is nowhere to be found. What do you do? Do you go for a walk? Do you read a fun book? Do you turn up the music really loud and start singing really loudly? Do you go to nature, the beach, or the mountains? What do you do? Our use of technology should not be for escapism or addiction. It should be for engagement. So sustained stress causes us to withdraw. It also, the second thing is that it actually reduces our awareness. So when we have a level of stress that has altered the chemical in our body and brains, it actually limits our ability to discern social cues and, and, and interpret social information. So it has this increased sense of confusion and anxiety. Has that happened to you recently? Where you were just on the go and multitasking too many things and you interpreted something perhaps the way that it really wasn't? 
Reduced awareness can cause feelings of being flooded, which is um, mental and emotional overload, where you literally cannot respond because you are in flight, fright, or freeze. And so the thing that happens with our online engagement is this. We might get flooded because we get really triggered or upset by something, and we assume a tone in what someone has posted. And we create a narrative based on the tone that we assume, and we respond with that same tone. That's reduced awareness. The third thing is immense tension. So we can withdraw in unhealthy ways. We can have reduced, tension, or reduced awareness. And then the last thing is immense tension. What happens is our increased anxiety actually limits blood flow to the brain, which we need oxygen and blood to um, think well, right? There's negative and confusing messages that happen. And what happens is our good communication and our good judgment gets clouded. Here's an interesting thing about tension. Renowned marriage counselors, John and Julie Gottman, say this about couples who are in conflict. When they're in conflict and they need to walk away for a little bit, it's not enough to physically walk away. They have to mentally walk away from it as well because if they've physically walked away but haven't mentally walked away, they're still chewing on it, it actually keeps the chemicals of fight, flight, or freeze in your brain. So the tension is still there. With regards to communicating online, sometimes there's this desire to just get it out, to spit it out, and so we want to do that. Don't do that. Instead, consider having a folder where you can like write it down, another app, like write down your thoughts, check back with it a little bit later, see if it's really worth it. We could spend so much more time talking about Sabbath and, and online engagement, but what I want to land with is this. Sabbath really should be a relational act. How does it look in the context of your own life? So for me, Currently, I am working as a professor and I have a toddler at home. And so here's how Sabbath works for me. The day that I Sabbath, once a week with my family, we have a routine. And one of those is to not check anything online at all. And I'm one of those people that doesn't like the red dots. So it actually reminds me a lot throughout the day how much I go to the red dots to get rid of them in order to, um, to have that sense of release. And instead, I choose to pray. But throughout the week, I also choose not to go online until I've spent time with the Lord. And right now, I'll be transparent with you, it's looking up a verse of the day, meditating on it, lifting up to the Lord, and moving on. And then once a week, I spend time in the Word. Right now, I'm reading Galatians, and it's great. So Sabbath is really important, and it really helps when we have a sense of how to breathe in our Sabbath living. And so right now, for me, my breath prayer every day is that my heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. What if you used a breath prayer, a prayer that you can say in one breath to kind of cool yourself down before re you react in an online manner? You know, being part of the body of Christ is really important to remember when we're online. It's important to remember that we should be communicating with the fruit of the Spirit, which of course we need help with, which is patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and what else? Self-control. We need the Holy Spirit. One thing I want to mention is that I know that Sabbath doesn't exist in the same way for every person. Quantitatively, we might have 24 hours in a day, but qualitatively, it might look very different for you. You might have kids or aging parents. You might have multiple jobs. You might have deep grief that you're wrestling with from what's going on in the world that is so sharp that it makes every day hard and feel really, really long and really, really short at the same time. But the thing that we need to remember is that in order to have good, healthy communication online, we must refuel with the Lord. We must cling to Sabbath. We must fight the gravity of this world that sort of pulls and warps the steering wheels and tires. Then we work so hard to get it back. And if we choose to Sabbath, if we choose to lean into the Lord, not just on one day, but with a heart attitude, it will change the way we hear the holy whispers. Thank you. <laughs> I need to grab a microphone. I'm so sorry. Ah, here we go. Dr. Malloy, thank you so much. My pleasure. I must tell you, I had the thought as I was listening, why did I get the Sabbath talk? <laughs> why? <laughs> Dr. Malloy, I'm terrible at Sabbath. Mm. And so I really resonated when you said, if you wait for a good time to do it, you're never going to get there. That really resonated with me. But it also resonated with me that being a novice uh, person who tries to do Sabbath, what were you doing early on that produced stress instead of comfort or release? Yeah, so I think 
when I'm, when I'm thinking about Sabbath, I, I have to tell you, I'm not good at it at all. It's kind of like running. I'm not good at running at all. I do it because I know it's good for me. And I actually really like to do it with community, which I think we should also be doing mm-hmm. in Sabbath. Um, but as it relates to stress, um, life, life has so many stressors. And we have to take a minute to realize what's happening that are causing those things. I love what you said that you, you kind of feel like Sabbath should be done all day rather than just picking like one day. Just for a second, what are some of the stereotypes of Sabbath that you think scare people away yeah. rather than embracing Sabbath? Ooh, that's such a good question. I think we tend to think of Sabbath as it should be um, alone. Mm. Sabbath is a communal act that's different than retreat or solitude. They often can go together, Sabbath and solitude or Sabbath and retreat, but Sabbath is, is, can be communal. I think we think Sabbath means that we should do nothing. And I think instead, it's more about resisting the tyranny of the urgent or obligation and paying attention to the things that enliven our hearts. So Gary Thomas wrote this great book called Sacred Pathways. And my husband and I read it. And really, it helps you figure out how do you get close to God? Because we tend to think of uh, being close to God is one way. Wake up in the morning, spend time on the word, pray, maybe sing a song, and you're good to go. In some ways, that actually does work for me, but it doesn't work for everybody. Mm. And I learned after reading that book that um, nature enlivens my soul. For my husband, it's an intellectual conversation. Mm. And so I think one of the misnomers or myths about Sabbath is that it has to look a certain way. So for my mom, gardening would bring her life. I can look at a plant and it dies. I just am not good at communicating with the plants, but I love to be out in nature. And so being out in the beach or in the mountains is great. Well, I love what you're saying about almost creating this spiritual reservoir before you go online. Mm -hmm. I love that attitude. I I love that practical thought of not denying what you're feeling, but but can you elaborate a little bit on writing it out before you actually jump online and express some of your thoughts? Well, yeah, and I don't know if you have this experience, but I tend to chew on the things that are happening Mm. in my brain. You know, I've got got certain things I want to say, and so I repeat them in my mind, and I try to, like, figure out the best way, and so sometimes I just want to get it out. You know, Mm. I want to just, like, send the email or post or tweet or um, put something on Instagram and just have it out of my system so that I can have a sense of, like, I don't have to think about that anymore. Mm. But really, oftentimes, we haven't given ourselves enough time to think about what does it sound like, who could be interpreting it in a different way. So I actually have a little note um, icon on my, on my phone app, and I'll sometimes write down something that I think I want to say. I'll just do something else. I'll go for a walk. I'll have a conversation, and then I'll revisit it. And half the time, I'm like, boy, that was not smart at all. <laughs> I'm so glad I did not send that. And the other time, I'm like, oh, no, this is, I do feel like this represents who I am. So if Sabbath is communal, then because sometimes I will write that email and I don't send it and I go back and reread it and I think, this is perfect. Like, yeah. I, I, think this, I think we are ready to go. <laughs> and I show it to my wife or somebody else and they're like, have you lost your <laughs> mind? So being communal, that's good to check with the Holy Spirit, but maybe even double check with people around you. Absolutely. And when I say Sabbath is communal, I realize that introverts, extroverts, ambiverts, all the verts, like we all have different responses to people and community. But I guess what I mean is, you know, when I was single... Um, I would go for a walk. I'd meet up with a friend mm. later. I'd do some really great cooking. I'd read, I'd watch a, uh, read a book or watch a movie. It was great. When I was newly married, we, had, we didn't have kids. We spent time looking at each other. <laughs> like, we didn't do a lot of other things with other people. We had, like, ice cream teas by the pool, and boy, do I miss that. Um, now that we have a two-year-old, mm-hmm. our routine is that we have pancakes in the morning in our pajamas. Mm. And then we do some prayer time together and just slow, real down. So re- slow down. And I think that it's really important to figure out what that looks like in your life. So. I, love the, I love the idea of breath prayer. Mm-hmm. So how can breath prayer work even as you're crafting that response? Can we, like, I almost view it as a speed bump. Oh, I like that. A little bit of a speed bump. Yeah. So can you elaborate just a little bit on how that might work? Yeah, and I think kind of even going backwards with that, we shouldn't be compartmentalizing our faith or our spiritual practices. Mm. So although Sabbath and tithing might be an act that we do as a symbolic understanding of something much larger, Sabbath should be more than just a day. It should be throughout the week. And I think Mm. the breath prayer is a really great sort of accountability or, or speed bump, like you just said, to do that. And so mine actually pops up on my phone every day at 11 a.m. I feel like it's late enough in the day where I might need to be reminded about, you know, what the Lord has said to me, but it's still early enough where, you know, good things can happen. Yeah. And so I think having a breath prayer when it relates to technology would be really helpful because it can just remind you to take a breath. I mean, actually the act of breathing mm. 
I, it, I mean, you talk to anyone who's in sort of the physical sciences and the physical health, it's a big deal. And I think it's a big deal in our spiritual life as well. So I do martial arts training. Yes. Breath is a huge part of yeah. it. Yeah. The, the, the founder of jiu-jitsu wrote a, finally wrote a book about uh, his practices, and he called it breath. Mm. He said that that is the foundation of everything. What mm. a great word. Can I ask you to be a little transparent? Sure. All right, here we go. Can you walk me through a moment when you realized, uh, when you were approaching online communication with a Sabbath mindset that you weren't necessarily doing a great job? <laughs> Every, every week, you know. Um, I mean, that's the thing. You know, I think for me, I've come to be comfortable with n realizing I don't do any of it well. Mm. But we shouldn't wait to do something well if we know it's the right thing to do. Mm. And so I think for me, you know, even, even in the last month, I remember um, looking at a red dot on my phone because I'm really bugged by the red dots. <laughs> and I thought, I'm just going to, like, I'm just going to erase the stuff that's junk. So tomorrow, after my Sabbath is over, I'll, like, I won't have any of the junk mail. And then I opened an, an email that was just, it was more work to my spirit than it needed to be. Mm -hmm. And I remember feeling immediate regret. But the thing that's so cool about that is the whole process is to help us remember to take it all to the Lord. Mm. We have to take it all to the Lord. And so um, we ask him for forgiveness. We say, help me to do better. And a mindfulness so that the posts of other people become humanized rather than just simply text on a screen. I love that. So I'm basically, I basically wrote down just a bunch of notes that I want answers to. So you can listen in if you want to. But here are my questions. Here's the mistake I make, Dr. Malloy. I guess I get confused between rest and leisure. Sure, yes. So I'm pretty good at, re uh, at leisure, which sometimes I can think, which I think is good sometimes. Mm -hmm. But if I'm just doing leisure and I'm not getting that relational fulfillment with the Lord, how can we understand if we're like slipping into, well, I'm just going to go to the beach, have fun, and not really include spiritual thoughts? Yeah, that's such a good question. And again, they can overlap, but they're mm. also not the same thing. So I think it was three years into our marriage. My husband and I were in Taiwan having high tea at this amazing building that overlooked this beautiful scenery. It was amazing. And it was three years into our marriage when we realized that we Sabbath very differently. Mm. We were having a conversation because mm. I need to like slow down. I like to be reflective and contemplative, and he is wonderfully an achiever, and so he loves to get things done and play and do things, but we have to all center it around the Lord in, on a Sabbath day, so we were talking about how we can support each other that way, oh, that's good. and so I guess, I guess what I want to say about that is anything we do on the day of Sabbath should be something that points us to the Lord. Mm. So whatever we're doing, if it's not helping us take it to the Lord, maybe save that for a, a day off, which is different. Um, but for me, like we play Hawaiian music in the morning and, and eat the pancakes. And there's something about the routine of that where I'm like, okay, Lord, you are my sanctuary. You are the place that I rest. My biggest takeaway, pancakes. <laughs> I'm, sure. I'm taking away pancakes. Dr. Malloy, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, what an invaluable idea that our online communication is linked to our idea of Sabbath and our relationship with the Lord before we interact with people relationally online. Thank you so much. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Chase Andre. Chase is one of our absolute favorite instructors in Biola's uh, communication department. Chase has an MA in Intercultural Studies from Fuller Theological Seminary with an emphasis on how do we create just peacemaking? His research focuses on how can communicative acts foster both justice and shalom in the public square. Chase is also in charge of our general education at Biola University, where students across disciplines take a class that he's helped create. How do you recognize messages that are embedded in culture, and how do you create your own message if you want to enter into the public square uh, be it online or through a speech or different types of interaction, students rave about the assignments and uh, the creativeness he puts into that general education course. Chase lives in Los Angeles with his wife, Alicia. They have two children, si uh, Silas and Naraya, and we are so thrilled to have Chase Andre be with us. When you think of heaven, what comes to mind? Now, if someone is, teaches communication, uh, my mind skips past the pearly gates and wonderings about what era of rock music the worship set will be in, and I think about our interactions. What will it be like to communicate in heaven? 
Now that's an abstract thought experiment at best, but I think it's a worthwhile one. Uh, And this is the reason why. I think the life of following Jesus is the answer, or at least our best attempt at the answer to the question, what is heaven like? To sum it up one way, I think the disciples of Jesus are to live here on earth with the value systems, the motivations, the priorities as they are in heaven. So that's what's motivating my question. How do you think we'll communicate in heaven? At the conference on digital hope, we're not talking about communication broadly, but specifically communication online. I don't know if you've noticed, but it's not all angels and harps and cupcakes out there in the cloud. In fact, communication online can feel a little hellish at times. Today, I want to examine the topography of social media and, and how it promotes and provokes us to respond and maybe make some implications for what that means for us as followers of Jesus. In 2012 to 2019, the impact-driven firm Weber and Shanwick released a study called Civility in America. In that final year, social media was voted the leading cause of incivility in the U.S. among the list of 19 other options. When researchers first asked respondents if social media led to incivility, only 24% of those who responded thought it did. But through the years, as it rose to the number one spot, that number more than doubled. Today, Americans report social media having a more negative than positive impact on civility in our country. All this comes two decades after communication researcher Deborah Tannen uh, ascribed the term argument culture to our society's pattern of speech. It's as if we treat every difference as provocation to do verbal battle, whether those differences are political or religious or (laughs) how we feel about tacos. Have you ever done this? Have you ever posted something online? Something as benign as, I love tacos. And then within three comments, someone says, what, so you don't like hamburgers? in and outs not good enough for you? <laughs> no, I, I just like tacos. <laughs> Angelo and Tochi and a team of researchers in Italy define online incivility as a manner of offensive interaction that can range from aggressive commenting and threads, incensed discussions, rude critiques, to outrageous claims, hate speech, and harassment. To which I think we'd all say, yeah, that sounds pretty uncivil. Maybe we'd even say, I've experienced some of that. In the two decades since our culture was first described as an argument culture, Incivility online has gone, uh, has become as ubiquitous as interaction online. Pew Research has found that a majority of teens have faced some sort of cyberbullying. And that Weber and Shanwick study suggested that Americans face on average 5.5 uncivil interactions any given week. In 2015, A sociologist and future MacArthur scholar, Dr. Tressie McMillan uh, Cottom, she put out an article that surveyed over 5,000 comments on her personal blog that she uses uh, to amplify her research. And of all the negative comments that she received, she found that they they spanned the gamut from uh, hostile questions about whether she had a legitimate place in the university to legitimate threats against her life and well-being. She notes that while her work online as a writer can amplify her research and hone her voice and establish herself as an expert, she could not stop the torrent of negativity, of threats, whether those came from strangers, from fellow academics, people who questioned her credibility, and people who threatened her well-being. It reminds me of a tweet from assistant professor of New Testament at Wheaton College, Dr. Esau McCauley, after receiving vitriolic backlash to his book, Reading While Black, he tweeted, I'm going to be honest. I'd heard about it happening to others, but I wasn't ready for the cruelty of Christians. Nothing can prepare you for it. Now I understand why so many Psalms deal with betrayal and slander. 
are more stories than I can recount. Christians are not immune to incivility online, whether receiving it or if we're the ones dishing it out. And I think it matters because online communication, social media, it's not going to go anywhere in our lifetime. But how we speak to each other and speak about each other, whether online or off, matters. Now, I want you to engage with me in a second thought experiment. Imagine, if you would, that we locked everybody up and took away all social interaction except that which is digitally mediated. And maybe for an entire year, we filled that year with controversy and conspiracy, uh, with contentious elections and social unrest. Are you finding this difficult to imagine? <laughs> well, what if after the end of that year, we just let everyone back out into public? Would the patterns of speech common online begin to trickle down in how we interact face to face? The Wall Street Journal released an article called Adults Are Throwing Tantrums in Restaurants, Planes, and at Home. Blame the Pandemic. It details emotional outbursts and sexual harassment, a torrent of petty rudeness that people working in the, the service industry are facing near daily. Now, the emotional toll of this pandemic cannot be overstated, especially as the article points out, this latest wave of the Delta variant and, and, and the whiplash that we're feeling from opening up and closing back down. But I don't think it's that whiplash alone that's leading to these uncivil and inexcusable outbursts. What if how we're communicating online has a hand in what we're seeing in the real world. Renowned rhetorician Marshall McLuhan is famous for saying, the medium is the message. But he also said, media is the massage. <laughs> As if uh, a chiropractor with one too many malpractice suits, uh, it, social media is, is leaving us maladjusted out of whack, or as McLuhan says, all media work us over completely. This working us over is what communication scholar Brian Ott has in mind when he said, every communication medium, medium trains our consciousness in particular ways. Twitter ultimately trains us to devalue others, thereby cultivating mean and malicious discourse. Twitter, and I would add the comment sections of Facebook and Instagram, invite simplicity over nuance. Uh, they reward impulsivity over thoughtfulness in a way that breeds incivility. It doesn't force it, but it certainly allows it to take place. And we've spent a year training our social impulses in this digital boot camp. Online and increasingly in our face-to-face -face encounters, our communication climate is deteriorating. In the work they do in the Winsome Conviction Project and in our communication classrooms here at Biola University, we talk about communication climate a lot. That's because uh, communication climates are shaped more by how we speak to one another than by the words that we say. So if browsing our timeline reads like a survey of constant dismissive remarks, sarcastic memes, slander, threats, it might feel like stepping out into the Arctic tundra or out into a storm, regardless of the topics that we're covering. Because it doesn't matter who our uh, communication is directed towards. It doesn't matter what side of which aisle we're sitting on. Even when we think we are right, how we communicate leaves a lasting impact on the people around us. As communication scholars, we care about cultivating affirming communication climates because we care about cultivating strong relationships with patterns of speech that are not just encouraging but effective and able to work together, express ourselves, and develop a mutual understanding. To return to my original thought experiment, I think that the culture, uh, the communication climate of heaven is one that's always loving, always kind always patient. It's, it's warm and inviting, <laughs> kind of like the, the weather here in Southern California. 
Now, while that thought experiment might be abstract and sure a little tongue-in-cheek, I don't think Jesus' discipleship is. In fact, I think Jesus cared a lot about cultivating communication climates and about Christians changing the climates of the cultures they're in. Matthew's gospel captures Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, a sort of inaugural address for disciples who want to live out the culture of heaven. It's tempting to read the sermon as religious platitudes or impossibly high standards of righteousness, but I choose to to view the sermon as instructive for our lives, a way of living and communicating in the world that prioritizes that culture of heaven, that seeks first the kingdom in all we say and do. Theologian and ethicist, the, the late Glenn Stassen, spoke of the Sermon on the Mount as a set of transforming initiatives that if lived out, shifted our social dynamics or communication climates. So for example, um, when Jesus in Matthew 5, verse 21 and 22 says, you have heard that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, raka, an expression of contempt, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, is in danger of the fires of hell. In this read, uh, Jesus is diagnosing a climate in verse 22 that leads to the murder in verse 21. And communication scholars would agree. If negative communication climates are allowed to spiral downward, they will end in real world violence. Because before murder, there was contempt. Before an angry outburst and assault over a mask mandate at a restaurant, there was anger online. But Jesus says, not so with you. There's another way. He goes on in the next verse to say, if you're headed to church to get right with God, check yourself. Make sure you're right with other people first. If you uh, realize someone has something against you, go quickly and make things right. I think what Jesus is getting at is this. When you sense a storm brewing, introduce a new weather pattern. As the proverb says, a kind word turns away wrath. So let's return to that description of online incivility. I'm tempted to hold this list up against the fruit of the spirit. Aggressive commenting, sounds like we need more gentleness. Incense discussions, a dose of patience here. Rude critiques, what about kind critiques? Outrageous claims, what about goodness? Hate speech, let love speak. Harassment, buddy, you need some self-control. Which is fine, it's good even. I think we should examine our interactions uh, against the fruit of the Spirit. Because if we don't see that fruit crop up in our words and deeds, maybe we should examine what vineyard we're planted in. If we're looking to learn the language of heaven, the fruit of the Spirit could serve as a kind of dictionary. But I don't want to stop there because I don't want to be perceived as giving license to use this list of virtuous communication as a measuring stick against the actions of others. As if the antidote to incivility is telling others, be more civil. This is what calls for civility so often boil down to. Just telling folks over there to stop doing that. Now, to be clear, (laughs) there are times where we need to do that. Uh, But in this moment, right now, I want to direct our attention to that moment when we want to respond in haste, in that moment where we've been offended and we want to return tit for tat. When that moment arises, let's commit to asking ourselves a few questions. First, am I able to respond out of love for this person? Or am I just trying to prove I'm right? Because being right is not the same as being righteous, right? Second, am I able to listen? It's easy to focus on trying to get the words just right, but shifting communication climates means tending to how we communicate even when we're not speaking. I've been convinced for a while that if we're going to love our enemies, even the micro enemies, the people we encounter online, then that love needs to be communicated. It's not just felt or thought about. If we're going to agape love our enemies as God agape loved us, then our willingness to engage in the perspectives of others, to 
practice empathy, to listen to the story, to hear out the reasons, should be, well, it should be as indiscriminate as the sun shining or as the rain. That doesn't mean our convictions change or that we do this because we think everybody's right. Uh, but it does mean that we do this because everybody's worthy of love. Because what good is it is if we express love to only those who agree with us? What good is it if we love those in our media echo chamber? How are we any different than any other media echo chamber out there? Practically, this might look like responding with an honest question when we're incensed by someone's comment, rather than assuming we know where they're coming from. Or it could look like making a proactive practice of reading thoughtful, well-written perspectives against our ideological opponents. As Paul says to the Corinthians, be quick to listen and slow to tweet. Finally, I want to ask you this. Am I aware of how social media is working me over in that moment? Creators of algorithms and billion dollar tech companies are poor stewards of our souls. Yeah, advocate for platform upgrades that make positive communication climates even easier. Get in the habit of Sabbath away from social media, but when you do engage, don't let the boot camp of your heart happen in the doom scroll of your timeline. When looking at the state of our communication climate online, it's easy to feel hopeless. But our digital hope will not come in the moments where we tell other people to be more civil, but when we could respond with incivility, but instead choose to love. Thank you so much, Chase. Yeah. I really appreciate the pastoral way that you shared um, how we can improve our online civility. So I had a couple of questions that I wanted to ask you today. Yeah. Oh, don't make that face. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the first one is knowing that you are someone who is a member of the Pacifist Club when you were an undergraduate. Well, that was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah that was a long time ago. Pacifist Fight Club. Yeah, the Pacifist Fight Club. I'm sorry, I forgot <laughs> Fight Club, as well as somebody who studied um, Martin Luther King Jr. extensively when you were in graduate school. Is there ever an excuse for online incivility? Yeah. <laughs> as we resurrect the Pacifist Fight Club, uh, another yes. tongue-in-cheek uh, name. But yeah, is there ever an excuse for incivility? That's a great question. And I have to recognize that it's really hard to make a universal answer to that. And so maybe a better question would be, uh, is there ever an excuse not to love? Mm -hmm. I, I think when I ask it that way, I feel the weight of responsibility in my response. Mm -hmm. Because if I see something that looks uncivil or maybe unloving, uh, have I done the work to examine why mm -hmm. they've answered the way they did? It's kind of like, um, like if my, my toddler has a meltdown in the grocery store and I respond out of my frustration <laughs> and the other people in the grocery store uh, look at me in that moment of response, <laughs> I wish they had seen the three hours where I was patient and loving and long-suffering, <laughs> but they saw that moment. Mm -hmm. um, so equally, do I ask the stories and the questions of what led up to the brief interaction. Uh, you mentioned Dr. King, and I, I think he embodies this well. Uh, the famous letter from a Birmingham jail is, is essentially a response to a group of pastors who said, I think that civil rights movement thing should be more civil. And he said, you know, no one who uh, has, ex has called for civility has ever thought my actions were well-timed. <laughs> but those who have suffered oppression, uh, they are the ones that, that um, f the, the burden of, of civility is, is placed on their shoulders. Uh, so am I willing to say, um, 
is love happening here? It, it means I need to ask some things. He was willing to do that too. He got a lot of heat for the riots that happened around the same time. And he practiced that sort of agopic empathy in saying, well, I, I, I don't endorse the riots, but I do understand them. He said the riots are the language of the unheard. Equally so, do we wait and listen to that which is unheard? Because all we have is that moment where we can respond. And I think that that's so important for us to be thinking about how we place the responsibility for civility on ourselves mm. and not on other people. Mm. Um, you know, my mom always told me when I was growing up that I was culpable to God for how I treated other people and that they would be culpable to God for how they treated me. So I couldn't respond in kind um, with a nasty word or um, with teasing back because I was responsible for that. So I think that that's so important. Yeah. So I think the next question that I would want to ask you then is if we're examining our own hearts, what are some things that you think about to help you gauge whether or not you're responding out of love? Whew, that's where it all, uh, you know, the rubber meets the road, right? Um, that's hard. <laughs> that's hard. I've tried to develop a practice, and I'm not always good at it, but I try to develop the practice that if I can't pray a blessing for the person before I respond to them, it's probably not time to respond. Um, so I, I, I've tried to uh, pray not just like, oh, Lord, go get them, <laughs> or oh, Lord, bless them, uh, but try to cultivate an actual prayer of blessing. Lord, bless you and keep you and make God's face shine on you. And if I can't get through that whole verse, it's, it's probably time for me to take a step back. And that's really great to um, that step back in terms of trying to pray through that and how long it takes to do that, I think, can even calm us down yes. a great deal as we begin to um, respond and interact with others. So I was wondering, listening to um, your great talk, what are ways that you think that we can cultivate um, over time, a sense of online leadership in the area of civility? Hmm. I think one of the most important factors of leadership is authenticity. Uh, and that, uh, not just authenticity, but integrity. Having what you espouse line up with, with who you are. Um, and so, by putting the pressure of civility on our shoulders, uh, by putting it on my shoulders, I, I can't tell anyone else to be civil until I'm acting it out or willing to, to do my best to act it out. And maybe even being willing to be uh, corrected. Uh, I think any way we can model what we wanna see uh, is good. And so there are times we're going to speak before we should. Uh, maybe there are times where what we say is going to be construed as, as offensive. You know, as we, we heard today, uh, Digital communication lacks a lot of the, the thickness of face-to-face -face communication. Tone can be misconstrued, misinterpreted. And so um, in those moments, being willing to take a step back and, and apologize really leads the way. I, I love that you just brought up apologies because one of the things that I also wanted to ask you was based on your discussion of communication climate, which is so important in all of our differing communication interactions, but particularly online. So I wanted to ask if you had any tips for how we can change the communication climate. If, for example, in that I love tacos um, comments, which I love <laughs> that you brought that up as an example, um, that all of a sudden you get people who are responding with, what about the hamburgers? Why don't you like hamburgers? What about in and out? What do you have against against that? What do you do in those situations to turn sure. the climate back to a lighthearted, pithy comment? <laughs> yeah, if you're good at jokes in the moment, God bless you. That's not everyone else's gift. But and you are good at that. Uh, thank you. <laughs> not always, but I, you know. I experience you as being quite good at that. I appreciate that. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> um, I, I love the advice that Dr. Sidnam suggested, that we lean into that which social media affords us, which is uh, our conversation is asynchronous. We don't have to respond in that moment. Unlike you asking me this question, I have to come up with an answer real quick. But uh, we can take a step back and we can slow things down. Um, we can make it a joke uh, or we can ask a question. Uh, I do like hamburgers but have you ever had a taco? I don't know, something like that. 
So as you have created your own online presence, what are some of the things that you think about? Um, I know that um, issues of biblical justice are very mm -hmm. important to you, and those are very contentious in the world yeah. right now, or they can be. People have very many differing ideas about those, but how do you make a decision about when it's time to post something to stand up or to just share that you think that something has happened is wrong or there should be a different course of action? And when do you choose other methods of communicating that? Hmm. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I can only answer personally. I don't think I can prescribe advice at this point uh, because it's as different as people's personality, people's... Uh, social standing and, 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 and positionality in life and what they're willing to show up for online. I, I'm not of the mind that you have to follow every hashtag and you have to put up every right photo on Instagram and you have to uh, do ways that is helpful, build movements and, and, and raise awareness, uh, but can also feel like a performance. And so, while there is a place for those movements and mass campaigns, uh, I'm not one to think that I have to jump on every one of those, even, even for the causes I care about. Um, and so giving myself permission to not enter every uh, battle, uh, every Twitter squabble, every Facebook war is, is a um, freeing thing. I, I've been online for a long time now, and, and I've noticed that my interactions have changed, what I'm willing to say, and um, where I feel like my voice needs to be has changed as well. And so I think nowadays I've spent more time uh, amplifying the voice of others rather than um, crafting a, a soapbox of my own. Again, that's not prescriptive, but that's where I'm at. And that so goes in line, I think, with a lot about your personality <laughs> as well to create sure. that space for other people. What's interesting um, that I wanted to add to what you just said is that the National Communication Association's uh, magazine for this, um, this issue actually came out talking about how organizations have used different social movements and now that's being seen as disingenuous. So when they post... Um, about cer certain change movements, and yeah. yet they don't have any change in their own organization. So I yes, think that that's absolutely. very key. It's a fun thing that we get to talk about in one of our classes as well. Yes, very much so. Mm -hmm. And so lastly, I just wanna ask you, um, how do we know if social media is working us over? Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think the answer is, it is. <laughs> it just is. If we're online, we're being worked over. Uh, the task is to know that and take proactive steps to change how we're communicating. Uh, limit our exposure, take Sabbaths, uh, know the different shifting audiences that we can step into, like the advice shared today, and, uh, and just recognize that it's happening. I, one of the best examples of this is research that just came out, an article by MIT Technological Review. Uh, they looked at the most recent data that we have, which is 2019, the top 20 Facebook uh, pages that are for Christians in the United States. Out of the top 20, 19 of them were run by what's called a troll factory. Wow. Yeah. So um, what, what, what the research found was people who, who are on Facebook didn't have to go to that page and press like to, to see this content. Facebook's algorithms were sending them this content, but the memes that were created by the top 20, 19 of the 20 uh, um, most farthest reaching Facebook pages for Christians in the United States were actually malicious actors somewhere in Eastern Europe. And so we have to recognize that not only do these structures shape us, but in today's age of misinformation, disinformation, there are others that are shaping our conversations. Now, I don't, I don't have the research or the data to say what those conversations were or why they were doing that, but there's proof that it's happening. So what are we going to do in response and how does that shape our interaction with 
culture because culture happens uh, on, online. Um, online, it's, it's not the public square because it's, it's not the literal square in the middle of our town, but, uh, but it, it kind of serves that way in a lot of ways. So um, I, I think it, that's why it's um, so important we have these conversations and I'm really looking forward to uh, the, the next conversation we're going to have. Yes, and I think that that's such a great thing in our department as well that we really try to help cultivate in our students an awareness of how they create and contribute to culture yeah. to shift the culture of Christians away from those negative memes that are coming from a farm um, somewhere else as opposed to <laughs> yeah. um, genuine Christian beliefs. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Chase. It was thank a you. pleasure to talk to you it was uh, honored um, to be here. about this. And so next I want to introduce uh, Dr. Tim Mulehoff, who you've uh, met with a bit already, but he is going to come and tell us about our next conversation that we'll be having. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, Chase. I love that we're having a food theme here, pancakes and tacos. It's important for us to take that away. One of the things I love about Biola University, this is my 17th year here, is um, that our departments don't compete with each other. And our scholars often collaborate with each other, which is such a fun thing to do and not always common to uh, different universities. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to bring on one of our top scholars who is going to help us think through this entire issue. She has spent her uh, career thinking about these issues. Dr. Carolyn Kim is the chair of Biola's Department of Public Relations and Strategic Communication. She's also the director of public relations programs. She's an award-winning scholar, educated, educator, and public relations professional. She works with global charities and national nonprofits developing creative PR and marketing campaigns. Her research interests include credibility, digital strategy, uh, strategy, social media, and PR education. Professor Kim's research has been published in several top-notch journals. Her book, Social Media Campaigns, has become the standard within her discipline. She's an accredited public relations professional and a speaker who regularly addresses audiences on the topics of social media, credibility, and digital communication. So we'd love to welcome Dr. Kim. Dr. Kim, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. This is Any great. food come to mind off the top of? A lot of food. It's Saturday, <laughs> but, but I'll see what rolls with the conversation. Okay, thank you. Um, Interesting, part of this conference happened because uh, our Associate Dean of Communication, Dr. Joy Qualls, who you've already met during one of the interviews and she's gonna lead a panel at the end, sent me a very interesting article by Tish Harrison Warren, who wrote in Christianity Today, don't quit Twitter yet, you might have a moral duty to stay. I thought it was very provocative. Uh, in it, she argues that while many Christian voices are making the decision to leave social media altogether or just be pessimistic. When I told people what we're doing today, uh, a conference on digital hope, I can't tell you how many people just went, good luck with that. So either a pessimism or just let's just abdicate and leave. She writes this, the pitfalls of social media are real, dangerous, and myriad. But the unavoidable fact is that people today find a public voice in part through social media. This goes for Christian writers, artists, and public leaders as well. These online spaces are where people, those whom Jesus loves, are talking about important things. This is where people share their work. So I'd love to ask you your thought of Warren's assessment, particularly has social media, in your opinion, become the new public square? Yeah. It was a great article. There was a lot of things that were pulled in and a lot of, a lot of things I could resonate with. And mm. I think as someone who has been in the social media circles for a while, pre a lot of the things that are here, I'm kind of accustomed to people pushing back on the idea that there's good that can come out of social media. Mm. It's, I think, a common thing. In fact, a lot of media ecologists, so scholars who study how technology develops and how that changes culture, point out that we're inevitably suspect of the recent technology, but we really adopt the, the one right before it because mm. it's proved not to be as scary as we thought. And 
Dyer, who's another Christian media ecologist, says technology is actually a promise that if we use it correctly, we reach a better world. It's, it's an aspirational hope towards where we want to head. Mm. So in some sense, I saw some of those coming out in the, the article. I think it's a public square. I wouldn't argue that it's the new public square. Mm -hmm. I think there's many public squares. And when we think of the original public square, the space in a community where people gathered, there's several factors there. There's a common group gathering that has a connection. Mm -hmm. In the past, it was mm -hmm. a geographic connection. Mm -hmm. And we see that in social media. We see these common groups connecting. But like we heard about earlier, context collapse has really made that complicated and nuanced. Mm -hmm. In addition, we have a willingness to enter in. So in the original public square, you literally needed to go to it. And you still have that with social media, but because of the time collapse, which we also heard about earlier, when people enter and exit, that public square is a little different than the original one. And I think we have a spectrum of perspectives. Some would say this is the public square, but that discounts the other places of deep social change and cultural change happening. Mm -hmm. And even the small face-to-face -face pockets that still occur in geographically bound, in time, synchronous squares. And yet it is something that's influential. There are conversations I think that'd be hard to deny. I know that feminist theorists have often critiqued even the original conception of a public square saying it wasn't so public, that there was always like gatekeepers to whether you could actually have a voice based on race or based on gender. Are there gatekeepers to this electronic public square? So good. Such a good question. Absolutely. Mm. And I think that's what we see with a lot of the things that have been concerning for some in the last couple of years. It's the social algorithm, the mathematical equation that has thousands of factors that determine what and when you will see something. And some of these factors are no-brainers, right? It's how often something's clicked with, engaged with, but there, there's a lot of other factors at play. The reason social media companies have algorithms is because their commodity is your attention. Mm. If they cannot keep your attention, they lose value. So they create an algorithm that curates information that you will most likely stay engaged with. And there we can talk about addiction and what pulls you in. But it also becomes a gatekeeping function because you could have a really great thing to say, something really insightful and meaningful and life-changing. But if you don't have an algorithm that supports it, your voice is mitigated if we are considering social media as a public square. So uh, forgive my ignorance, but, but I've always wanted to ask this. So let's say you and I open up our separate computers and we want to research a topic. Um, we, we punch in the very same thing, like let's say uh, a feminist uh, public square. So the algorithms would give us possibly two different avenues of research, one's being tailor-made to me and one's being tailor-made to you? Yes. Absolutely, because if you've interacted with certain people more, whatever they've said about that feminist research theory will show up more likely than the people I've interacted with, as well as articles that are performing in general under that search term, so we would call that a query, the, the words you literally put in, how many people interacted with that and how prominent that Facebook page or that person is even outside of their connection to us. And so we have second and third level influencers that dictate what we'll see. And this isn't just in social media, it's, it's how search engines work as well. So Google and Yahoo and Facebook and TikTok and Twitter and LinkedIn, all of them are using algorithms. So tell me if this is a bad uh, um, illustration. And I'm not knocking Netflix. Two of the greatest gifts God has given to the fallen world, <laughs> Amazon Prime, yes, right? And absolutely. sometimes two days is too long. You need history of Yiddish sheep herders today. Uh, but so Netflix, when, you, when you're watching whatever you're watching, a series or a movie, it says rate this and it will give you more titles based on if you just gave it a thumbs up. Is that sort of kind of Netflix? They're, they're gathering data from you to determine what you're more likely to think. And if you know so, so social algorithms and how they use it, it's really helpful because you can start making it curate things more for you. An example, and some of my students here at Biola even do this, and they taught me, so now I do it. <laughs> on Instagram, when I'm scrolling, if I get a Facebook yeah. Prime ad, I will intentionally, even if I'm not buying whatever great sweater they're showing me because it's fall here in Southern California, I will click through so they track me going to Amazon so they think, oh, she's interested in that. Because then the future ads are more likely to look like I want them to. And so that's ad tracking, but also algorithm tracking. The same would be true with Netflix or anywhere. Digital products that seem free or seem like there's just any interaction, all that data is taken and tracked for some reason because it's valuable and it creates a different human experience on the technology side. 
So we're just in year two of the Winsome Conviction Project, yeah. but one of the things we were discovering is that these groups that we belong to electronically or in person have, can easily become echo chambers. Mm -hmm. So what you're suggesting, it seems to me, is that these could very well be echo chambers where now you're getting very similar products, movies, as well as even political and social opinions based on these algorithms. Yeah, it could happen. See, I did an interesting study last year around echo chambers because we'd been hearing a lot about that, especially with the election and mm -hmm. with the polarization that was happening. And while there is this concept of echo chambers, for sure you're going to see reflected to you content that you are more likely to engage with, so it creates this. What they found is that you have high media use, and we would clarify that as someone who's on Facebook as well as Instagram or maybe mm -hmm. multiple channels, mm -hmm. you're less likely to be in those echo chambers because you're still creating different experiences. So they found that it's not not quite as conforming as we once thought they were, ah. even though it is something that is there. So it's, it's an inhibitor, but it's not a barrier all the time, if that makes sense. Yes, good, that is good news. Um, do you believe with her assertion, uh, and again, of course, she's, she's ha creating a title that will get us to read it. It's a great title. I it is it. a great title. I thought it was really good. Do you think Christians have a moral responsibility to stay engaged on social media? I love that question. As a public relations scholar, that's a space I want to be in a mm -hmm. lot. And the first thing I think of is what is moral obligation or duty? And so to me, as a Christian, I bring the perspective of a moral obligation to humanize people and to steward our communication well. Quentin Schultz, who's a communication mm -hmm. scholar, talks about our stewardship responsibility, not just to echo our own reality into spaces, but God's reality. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think there's huge opportunity in social media to bring the good, the beautiful, and the just things of the world to light. I, I think moral obligation tied to any inherent behavior always for all people is a little hard in sense of technology mm. because some people respond to technology very different. Um, so I have a, a little one, and my goal is maybe that he'll never have a cell phone. I'm thinking maybe 30, maybe <laughs> at 30 he can get a cell phone because I understand what technology does, particularly right, as we right. study the frontal lobe and your capacity right. to understand things. And yet, I'm a professional who spends my day mm. in and day out mm. in social media, so I believe in its value. I believe there's moral opportunities there where we speak truth and echo God's reality, and there's huge chances. I always tell my students, we're called to be a city on a hill, a light. And if we can't go into the darkness, who's going to go there? If not mm -hmm. us, who? Mm -hmm. If not mm -hmm. now, when? That kind of concept. But I'm always careful to nuance that because technology is powerful and people respond differently depending on what's happening in their own experience. And she kind of reflects that a little bit. I, I yeah. appreciated her honesty. She actually calls it a cesspool, which is interesting. <laughs> <She did. laughs> um, but she also, she says this, we've all heard the studies Social media decreases our ability to think critically, increases rates of depression, fuels anxiety and distraction. Facebook and Twitter often make our conversations more combative. So if we're all spokespeople for God, then we probably need to do just a little bit of a analysis of how much is this affecting me as I engage in any particular type of media, particularly social media. So do you agree with her assessment um, that it decreases critical thinking, and I've always heard this about increases rates of depression. Can you comment on those two quickly? It does. Uh, the studies show that. When mm. Anytime we see a study, I think you always want to dive down into who, how, and when. So it can do that. I think a lot about technology is how we approach it, how we use it, and our view of it. Mm. The recent study I saw, it's a stat. It's a little old because technology stats are changing constantly, but in the last two years, 90% of our content was created out of all of the content we have. Mm. And part of what we're seeing is social media exposes us to a lot of content, and we don't actually have a lot of self-agentry over much of it. We see a lot of hard, dark, and difficult things happening, and we literally cannot change it, but we're constantly seeing it, and it's coming faster than at any point in history. Mm. These things may have occurred at this pace previously, but now we see them all and constantly. So it does change our view of how we see the world, but in that, I think if social media is an extension of our offline reality, we have to constantly ground ourselves and be thinking about how that information exposure is shaping us, but what we believe to be true about the nature of this world, the nature of mankind, the purpose and trajectory of culture, and our part in it. I think when we're critically approaching it, and critical as in thoughtful in mm -hmm. our approach, we can be more 
um, limited in how much it can impact us. But that is a, something each person needs to guard carefully. So I remember reading Nicholas Carr is Google making us stupid, <laughs> and in it he <laughs> not these great titles. They are so good. I mean, it's um, so he came up with this term power browsing, mm -hmm. which just kind of stayed with me because I so let me make an admission. Uh, up until two years ago, I had a flip phone. Um, part of it was because I, I just didn't want all of that with me 24 seven. Uh, but now, Dr. Kim, I love my phone. I, I love my phone. Yeah. But when I turn that thing on, I am bombarded with headlines. Mm -hmm. uh, everything from uh, US troops le leaving Afghanistan, uh, Supreme Court justice, um, just made the decision that, in fact, President Biden can mandate uh, mask wearing. Now, all I know are the headlines. I just don't have time to click on each one of these. So I, I almost feel like a healthy dose of intellectual humility because I'm literally one or two headlines deep on certain issues. So how, how do we navigate that, being bombarded constantly with these different headlines about complex issues, but I do not have the time, attention, or wherewithal to just really find out what's, what's happening with troop withdrawal in Afghanistan. So how do we navigate power browsing in a way that we're not overwhelmed, but at the same time thinking we're we might not be as smart as we think we are? Yeah. I think one, just the awareness that we are power browsing mm -hmm. is a pretty good thing because we've, we've switched as you study technology and its development, we've actually switched from what we mean when we say we know something. In the past, mm. knowing something mm. meant you knew it in your mind and you could memorize it, you could talk about it. Right. Now, it often is used to mean I can find that information. And so when I say I know about that, I can click the headline if I want to. I haven't necessarily. Right. And so it changes our type of conversation. There's a public relations scholar who talks about how organizational communication works. And I think it actually applies here, even though this is more interpersonal. He says that we typically have an architecture of speaking versus an architecture of listening. And that's fundamentally different. We're more mm. ready to say something than we are to, to hear it. And in social media, part of the drive towards it is to say something. But I would say one of the things that we can do to be cognizant of our power browsing and to have that intellectual humility is to take time to listen when we don't actually have a lot to say on the conversation. Mm. You can do things like like someone's comment without making a statement about their comment. You can choose to join into these communities and hear. Social media listening is a great underutilized opportunity, I think. How, so how do we work that muscle? Uh, I was, uh, somebody referred to me this, uh, I'm not sure if you are aware of it, allsides.com, yeah, yeah. which, is, which is this wonderful website where you go and you pick an issue and it gives you, now they pick it, but it's the left, the center, and the right. And I, I'll, be, I'll just be transparent. I just love that idea, but it is totally overwhelming. It's like, I just don't, I'm not going to read three separate um, articles about this one issue. So I, I, I guess I love it theoretically, but wears me out. So uh, to speak to our audience, how do you develop this muscle of, of going deeper maybe than just power browsing? Yeah, it's hard because I think all of us are going to have to figure out our threshold for how comfortable we feel like mm. when we know something. A practice I have is I regularly pick up the perspective that I completely disagree with and I make sure I'm reading the best person on mm. their recent mm. book on it. I'm watching their TED talk on it before I say anything, before I even read the abbreviated version because I want to hear from them. And until I have the space to do that, I don't comment on it. And if I'm honest, my time is not a lot. And so mm. there's some issues that I have been completely silent on, not because I don't think I have a perspective on it, mm -hmm. but because I don't feel like I've listened enough to join the conversation. And so sometimes I take a year and then I'm out of date, but at least I've been <laughs> listening. And to me, that is an, that's a moral obligation to me that I've dignified the other well enough to listen wholly to their perspective and make sure I found the the other perspective, because it's great that they can curate the left, the right, and the middle. Sometimes it's hard to find those, and sometimes mm. it's actually not enough. Mm -hmm. And so I think taking the pressure off of us to feel like we have to rush to know and giving ourselves the space to say, I'm okay taking a year to understand this, because this is a big issue, and it matters, and I'm willing to sit in the tension of the conversation happening mm. with me listening. So when the book of Proverbs says a word spoken in the right circumstances, 
uh, is compared to fine jewelry, you're saying we probably need to put the brakes on and not be so quick to assume I know enough to talk about this issue and just be quiet. I do that, especially in social media, because social media is very large. Now, I am totally great talking to my friends or one-on-one -on -one with people that maybe they have a completely different perspective. Mm. I would love to grab mm. coffee and chat with them about it in more asynchronous live time as I'm processing, but I would not process or think through until I've thought deeply in social media, given the public sphere that we've talked about, context collapse and time collapse. So I love that. A group of people that you're kind of working it out, like, like showing the uh, first draft of a book. Yeah or an article and just kind of working out with a group of people that are safe and you can say, at the Winsome Conviction Project, we like saying, okay, don't hold me to this, but I think I think about this particular topic. Yes. And having, so do you feel like you have a group of people like that that you can just kind of process and talk about things? I do, different people for different topics for mm. sure. And I think one of the things that I really value and I wanna model as a cultural practice for others is being willing to be a lifelong learner, being willing to get mm. it wrong, mm -mm -mm. to change my perspective, to address and adjust. And that takes vulnerability and it takes a lot of courage because if you put everything out there and it almost cements on social media, it's hard to change things on social media. But if you can do that in live time, I think it's a soul-shaping initiative that's well worth it, and it changes how you approach conversations online and offline. So that processing group, theoretically, could of course be an online group, mm -hmm. a small group before you go public with your thoughts and attitudes. That's great. Yeah. Um, so uh, um, depression rates, I I've always, so I've heard this, I don't know much about it, this is not my area, yeah. but, but what is it, because I've heard this about Facebook particularly, that it fuels depression rates. Is this? It's true. Okay. They ran experiments without telling people they were running them to see if it worked. It does. <laughs> um, there's a lot of reasons for this. So you, mm. again, I always try to break it down by the people. Adolescents are having a lot of depression. One, because they're at an age where they make really bad decisions. Again, that frontal lobe, mm. not fully developed. Mm -hmm. They're gonna make mistakes, but now instead of like when I was in middle school and made a mistake, now it's captured on a phone, it's shared on video, it's put on mm -hmm. these groups. We also have the, this is the age from adolescence all the way through about at the end of college, typically, where mm -hmm. you're doing deep identity formation. You are transforming yourself. And so we have students doing things like you know, my parents want me to be friends with them on Instagram so I can have an Instagram account. So here, mom and dad, here's my Instagram. And then they create a shadow account and that's where they put their real identity. And so mm. this very digital act of separating mm. your identity creates problems. Then you have body esteem issues, you have the addiction habits, mm -hmm. young people are really highly hit. Then if you look at it further, when you start looking at like late 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, you start seeing depression about things like, oh my goodness, everyone else has a house. They're getting a mm -hmm. married, they had a kid. I'm here, I'm not doing enough. They got the good job, I don't have a good job. And it's this constant comparison, which it's different when you're seeing people face to face instead of online and just seeing those updates. So it's actually made me start wondering, they, they used to have this thing called the humble brag creator where you could put in your accomplishment and it would give you a way to humbly brag <laughs> on social media. And I was like, that's so great because then it doesn't sound so bad. And then I was like, wait, why is that what I need to put out there? And mm, it made me question, mm, how mm -hmm. often am I gonna put out something about that and what is the end result that I'm hoping for? Because the other thing that can happen, maybe you have something good to share and you post it, then you're likely to be watching to see how much reaction you can get. So you can actually become depressed if you don't get a good enough reaction to the thing that you thought was really valuable until you put it on social media. My kid is really cute. Why did I only get five likes? <laughs> I did get a great job. Why did no one comment? So it can go both ways. It's hard. You know, what you said just made me think about giving grace to people, how adolescents are working this out in real time in front of everybody. Do you remember... Uh, this young lady, and I want to say she was 12. Remember she took a selfie at Auschwitz and just got hammered. Yeah. And uh, there's a scholar, Craig Detweiler, wrote, wrote an essay coming to her defense saying, let's have a little bit of compassion because uh, she's working it out. She's developing that discernment, that maturity. I thought that was, I thought that was a good word. And I must say, I was one of those who kind of looked at that and shook my head like that just... but. What a good word to give people a little bit of grace as we're working this out uh, yeah. publicly. Yeah. 
You know, um, Leonard Sweet says that technology is indicative of the core human longings, mm. that we're using it to express our desire to be known and mm. to know others. And we also have another scholar who says, Hoover, who says that media embodies our chief values. So when you start thinking, is this embodying my chief values? And when you start watching other people and saying, what is this telling me about your personhood? I, as a Christian, believe people were made for relationship and that communication is designed to bring truth that draws you into more of yourself, more mm -hmm. connection with God mm -hmm. and others. Mm -hmm. So when I see a, a person either take a picture in Auschwitz or any number of other things, before I react too strongly, I hope my question is always, how are they trying to connect it through this? How mm. am I seeing their personness mm -hmm. versus their fault? Because it's so easy to find the fault. But part of our redemptive power in social media is pushing back the mistake and seeing the human dignity and drawing that out more. Mm. Saying, where can I see God's lights shining in this and how do I amplify that? So that's where we look. So if we make the decision to stay, and now we're going to interact w with a medium that can lend itself to what Deborah Tannen talks about the argument culture. Mm -hmm. First, how do we protect ourselves? It just strikes me that this is how you make your living. And how do you protect yourself? Uh, Dr. Malloy talked about Sabbath rest. Mm -hmm. um, how do you set up these barriers, these protections in a medium that you've spent your career studying? What would be some suggestions to those of us who are going to stay, but how do we uh, get dressed in our technological armor before we wade in? Yeah. There's a couple things I'd recommend. Some very basic ones is don't try to be all things to all people. Don't mm. get on every social media channel. Mm. Figure out which ones fit your unique style and need. Like a lot of my students like TikTok and they hate Facebook. I don't have any reason to try to get them on Facebook. I don't have any reason to be on TikTok. I'm more <laughs> of an Instagrammer. So knowing the channel and what works well for you, I think is one thing. I would also really encourage people to think deeply and hard about whether social media is where you want to decide to enter high stakes conversations. Mm, mm -hmm. I tend to enjoy high stake conversations in small groups or offline. And then I build relationships through social media. So people that I deeply disagree with, but deeply love, mm -hmm. I am intentionally going on social media to connect with and see their updates because I'm building my relational collateral because I know the power of high impact conversations can happen offline. Sometimes I have made a strong stance on social media for something I deeply believe in and I feel like it needs to be known, but I would say that's once a year or less and it's very, very limited because I don't mm. see that as something mm. that's gonna change a lot of minds because we tend to applaud those we agree with and close off those we disagree with. So social media, I'm, I'm the person who wants to draw in the people who I disagree with and it's hard on social media, so I take it to a different platform. But I also know that it's deeply relational and I can listen and I can know a lot about what's happening. And so not being in that space is hard. And the third thing is Sabbath is a lifestyle for sure. Like we were hearing earlier, I literally have a black box in my home. It's a cute box, right? It's like wicker and it has some like flannel on it. But our phones go in that box. Five o'clock on a weekday, it's done. You're not going to reach me. And weekends, like 5 p.m. Friday till I come back to work, my phone is off. And that means I'm not calling people. I'm not available. I'm not texting. Mm. My computer shut down. And that's because I need those limits to oh, be healthy. Oh, your computer's included with the cell phone. Yeah, I don't touch the digital world. Yeah. I'm not always good at it. That's I'm aspirational. Just feeling way too convicted. Um, I think some people would be surprised, Dr. Kim, that a person of your stature your training, your expertise. I, I can envision some people pushing back saying, with everything that's happening in the world that desperately needs the Christian perspective, yeah. you only maybe pick one issue a year to, to kind of use your capital and speak about that issue. At least on social media. I'll At least go on to conferences, oh, such a great distinction. I will speak okay. to small groups. I will talk one-on-one. -on -one. And I'll use dark social. So dark social is the non-public facing. It's a Facebook message, one-on-one. -on -one. It's an Instagram okay. DM. Mm -hmm. So dark social, I'll do because I, can, I know who I'm talking to and I know how we're going there. But I find that my impact and my credibility rises when I'm very careful about the timing of what I say in social media and why. And then when I do say it, 
I've had people from all spectrums and all sides come on board and they understand. I've actually had really positive responses in terms of civility because of all of the work that it takes to get to that moment and that space. All the preparatory work that it takes to get to that. You know, feminist educators used to use this chip method uh, mm -hmm. because sometimes they would just feel that males would dominate. So you had one chip. Yes. And, and during a conversation, you could play that chip anytime you wanted to, but you only had one chip. And once the chip was done, you could not speak until all the chips were in, and then they just redistributed the chips. Wouldn't it be interesting to approach this ne next year to say, I have one chip, one issue that I'm going to go all in only if I've done the preparatory work ahead of time? Yeah. Oh my goodness. I think it changes things. And it doesn't mean you can't, like, someone else is talking about something you agree with. You can like their post because that helps the algorithm. You're mm -hmm. still contributing. But I think that's a really good approach, the one chip approach. And I love the fact that you're saying there's so many other, that's why I love when you said, uh, is it the public square? No, it's a public square. So we're in these uh, interactive moments. We're just talking about one very specific line of communication, online communication. Yeah. Well, Dr. Kim, thank you so much thank you. for joining us in this conversation. We're going to take just a one-minute break uh, and set up a panel where the panelists are going to talk to each other and entertain questions. So a one-minute break, and we'll be back with our panel. Well, welcome back. We are so glad to enter into this last uh, segment of our time together. Uh, Dr. Mulehoff reminded me that I did forget to introduce myself the first time I came on stage, so I did want to take a minute to do that. My name is Dr. Joy Qualls. I am the Associate Dean for the Division of Communication here in the School of Fine Arts and Communication at Biola University, and it is such a pleasure that every person that you have seen on stage today is either an alum or a faculty member in our division, and so we expand just beyond communication studies into public public relations and strategic communication and digital journalism and media. And so in our division, these subjects of digital hope matter a lot to the work that we do. So thank you all for being here today and what a privilege it is to work every single day with each of you and so, so grateful for that. Well, we have had some questions come in and we would love to have some additional questions. We will be checking our online spaces uh, as well over the course of this panel. So if you have additional questions that you've thought of, please feel free to send them in and we will get as many of your questions answered as we can. So let's jump in, shall we? Let's do it. All right, so Dr. <laughs> Malloy, the first question goes to you. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the question is, is it possible to Sabbath online? And so the question is this, perhaps for some, they don't have space for social media or online engagement in their day-to-day -day lives, but they don't want to abandon in the social sphere. What advice might you give someone to find Sabbath in an online space? Wow, that's such a good question. I'm so glad um, that you asked that, so thank you. I guess it goes back to the point of Sabbath. So, so what practices are you doing on the day or space and time that you're wanting to help be extra mindful of the Lord? And so actually, I do go on social media one time on Sabbath, and it's to post that I'm Sabbathing. And I had this like weird interaction with myself of, is that, is that bad? Is that good? And I realized that because I care so deeply about it, I actually wanted to be publicly accountable. Mm -hmm. But I don't actually check the responses. I, I avoid the red dots entirely. It's so hard for me. But, um, but I, do, I do that. So I would say in response, what are you doing that helps you stay focused on the Lord Anything else, let's just save that for later. If the practices of engaging on social media truly help you um, contemplatively and relationally interact with the Holy Spirit, 
I don't know. I'd love to hear about it. I'd love to hear about what you're doing. And I don't think that that's necessarily wrong. Awesome. So we can find that space. I love the accountability aspect uh, that you talked about uh, as well. Um, Dr. Kim, the next question uh, I think goes uh, as a follow-up to the conversation you just completed. So we, we'd hope to give you a little bit of a break <laughs> between discussions. Okay. But um, uh, this commenter says uh, that they once heard that in, in an online space, we are not buying a product, we are the product. What are some ways in which we can effectively engage while keeping in mind that we're not buying something, we are being sold? I think even the knowledge that you are selling your data is going to be the first step. You have to be careful what you give away, everything from the images you use to the places you tag to the, the content you have to the friends that you tag can all be used. Every time you link an app and it shares data from your phone list, you're giving away data. And that is personal information. And so I would be mindful of how much you're willing to trade. Different generations are more comfortable with giving away information. But I think we've seen in the last two years a lot more awareness of how valuable our data is and what it means. I taught a class right before COVID hit on the dark side of online and how much we do with data. And I think for our college students, it was really overwhelming to see how many kids under the age of 18 have their identity stolen because of information that others posted about them online, or how many people have had incredible information about them posted at the darkest moments of their life, which is why in Europe they started the right to be forgotten law so that you could overcome and regain this idea that people evolve. So I think just knowing that it is occurring can make you more cognizant of what you give away. And I don't think it's wrong that data is used. I'm in PR. We want to use their data. We want to use my data too. Um, but you want to be careful and you want to be cognizant of what you're trading for the space that you're occupying. You know, this is making me think about the fact that we are sense-making creatures. We talk about that as communicators. And so one thing that occurs to me is the urge or the desire to share ourselves, our thoughts, our ideas is not a bad desire. I think it's where we share them. And so thinking about, it, do I need to post this or share this here? Or is there a different place that I should share it? Because I think, you know, we talk a lot about, is our nerves bad? Like, is it bad to be nervous? And the answer is no. In fact, I think it's something like 76% of experienced speakers or communicators are still nervous. It's how we channel the nerves. And in the same way, is it bad to want to share ourselves and our thoughts and our ideas or have differing opinions? Absolutely not. It's not bad. The question is, where are we doing that? Is our immediate or first response somewhere that people don't even really know us? Yeah, and, and how we face those differences, too. Uh, is it bad? Well, no. What if we approached the differences that we encounter online and say, that's not bad. I shouldn't expect you to disagree with me. I should expect you to disagree with me and maybe we can still come to some mutual understanding or at least some mutual respect together. I read an article this week and I should have uh, gotten the title and the author to appropriately source it uh, as I would expect any of our students to do. Uh, but it was arguing, I want to say it was Christianity Today or one of those publications, but it was arguing that perhaps we've made an idol of the truth, meaning that we have created a, an idea that as long as we're speaking truth, it doesn't really matter what harm might come to people because the truth is the ultimate good in that situation. So this question kind of speaks to that concept as well and says, how do you, and, and, and Professor Andre, I'll direct it this way, okay. how should Christians uh, engage um, or, or how do you engage Christians who are more interested in truth than in love and encourage them to speak truth in love instead? Oh, that's excellent. Man, all we have is our response. <laughs> <laughs> and so if that encouragement needs to happen, it can be modeled um, or it can be maybe done on that back channel in the private message uh, instead of putting them on blast. Um, you know, telling someone, hey, that was harsh can also sound kind of harsh. So uh, are we willing to embody that love that we're seeking from the person that's coming down a little hard on truth? I read something, and I should have um, uh, cited it, uh, been prepared to cite it, but they want to look at, uh, or they suggest we look at um, difference of ag uh, uh, agreement or dif uh, disagreement, that's okay, or maybe this conflict is caused by or could be remediated by um, 
some discipleship. And so maybe the issue is the person just needs to learn how we as Christians can embody the way Jesus acts in the 21st century. Um, and then maybe it's beyond that, and, and that would be some, for probably not on social media. <laughs> There's this really great term um, called discursive closure, hmm. which means that we use words to close down conversation. And I think what I was thinking about when I'm hearing that question is that truth is only one part of the equation. We can't compartmentalize Christianity. And of course, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But Jesus is also love. And what is love? Love is patient and love is kind. So it's sort of using only one part of a, of a body and not using the whole body. To say that I'm speaking truth without love means you're actually speaking incomplete truth. It's not actually full truth. That's good. I think it's really interesting too, if we go back just to even technology development, when you look at Socrates, he had deep concerns about us using writing. Why? Because it doesn't etch souls in the same way it etches papyrus. And this is the same thing. Let me tell you the truth, but let me be disconcerned with the etching of your soul or the impact because of it. So I think when we can back up, and I often, suggest to my students, and I'm not a theologian, but I like to dabble in theology, that communication is not an act, it's an attribute. It's actually a reflected attribute of God, and it's one of the first things we see in Genesis is the Trinity modeling what communication is supposed to do. It creates life, and it draws us into relationship. And so I would suggest that when we say speak the truth, you've only, like we just said, had half the equation because we're not actually understanding what speaking does. Speaking is an, a reflected attribute of our divine fingerprints of God on every human soul. I love that reflected attribute. That's, that's beautiful. There's a, a scholar, um, Robert Kraft, who was a missionary and an intercultural studies scholar, and he wrote a book um, um, on Christian witness, communication, for, uh, com communication theory for a Christian witness. And he said that uh, we as Christians go to the Bible to figure out what our message is. And that's good, but we should go to the Bible to figure out how to communicate that message as well. And that God is a communicating God. In fact, God is always receptor oriented. God is always communicating in the language of the people God wants to communicate with. That's us, that's us. God literally, put flesh on and learned our language, <laughs> walked around and figured out our, our customs and our values and beliefs and, and was raised in our culture, broadly speaking, as, as humans, in order to communicate with us. So um, the act of communicating the gospel should be as, uh, as incarnational as the gospel itself. And I feel like I want to at least say to those that really value like speaking the truth, we need you. It's not that you're doing it <laughs> yes. wrong. It's just that we, you need to do more. Yeah. It's not that that gift that you have to perceive what is not truth should be lessened. It's that you want to add to it. So I feel like sometimes there's some shaming that goes on um, accidentally by saying, no, 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 that's not kind. Well, that's true. Um, so add the kindness, add the love. Don't subtract yourself, um, add more. Mm -hmm. Continue to be a learner. Well, several of you who spoke today uh, referenced uh, the verse in James 1.19 to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, uh, which seems harder to do in social spheres than in other places. So I would love to hear from each of you, and, and uh, Dr. Beloy, I know you just finished speaking, but perhaps you can start this one again to say, um, how do you think we actively listen in an online space? Wow, that's a really good question. There are at least five different types of listening. So just hearing is the process. It's the passive concept of listening. And it goes all the way from you know, information seeking where you're, it's kind of like you're skimming. You know, you're kind of like waiting to say, oh, that's important. I need that. Um, there's even self-reflective listening where you really are wanting to know how you are doing. And, but then there's conscious listening where you're actually participating in a collective sense of how is everybody doing. On social media, I think it just takes more time. I think we have to slow ourselves down. It's so instantaneous. I think we forget we're still in charge. We can still decide when we're posting this. And so part of listening is slowing down. I think the second and, and very important part is what Dr. Kim talked about. We have to surround ourselves with people who we disagree with, who might provide a different perspective. We literally need to have them be a pulse check for us. I think that if we are only hearing an echo chamber, we will soon have only silence in our ears. We have to hear the beautiful voices around us and l allow that to fully provide dimension in what's going on. 
mean, yes, <laughs> yes. I don't know what else I'd say. I, I think the slowing down is a really powerful part. There's a thing about social media that makes you feel like you need to move fast. We check it, that we have all the analogies of I'm gonna take five minutes and an hour later I'm still on it. It's often because you go deep and go deep. So I think you have to enter with the intention of listening, with the intention of seeking out those other voices, taking time to look through your close friends list, all of the things, because it's too easy to be distracted otherwise. And the distraction of social media can be one of the reasons that we have less impact when we speak and when we listen. So one of the things that you come to find when you are more public in your social media is that there are plenty of people who want to engage in destructive conversation. And a lot of times that's not in the immediate public sphere. Those private messages, uh, the DMs as it were, tend to be the spaces where a lot of people will go if they have something negative to say. And, and I think each of us could probably speak to an instance where we've had someone send us a message that struck at the core of who we were or felt as if it was hostile in some way. And, and so I wonder, um, we'll start with you, uh, Professor Andre, wh what do you think is a way that we can combat this negative energy as a means of gospel engagement as we think about uh, not just not feeding trolls, but how do we combat trolls uh, so that um, it becomes a less uh, desirable thing for, for somebody to engage in? Yeah, that's excellent. The first thing I want to say is that I, I've received some backlash in my uh, decade or so online, but um, not as much as others. And, and I know others have, have received so much more than I have. Um, and so I, I have to say I've learned from watching others. Um, the second thing I want to say is I, I would distinguish between trolls and trolling. Uh, trolls I would call those anonymous actors who hide their humanity when they have these conversations. Um, those can be dismissed. Those don't have to be engaged. Those can be deleted, send to spam, all of that. But those who are trolling, um, I'm really inspired, encouraged by the, the, the people with platforms who choose to respond and use their names. I think it's something really disarming to see someone use a name in a social media post. Uh, we all know our name is there, but we're not expecting it. And so uh, the, the people that, that humanize the moment, um, you, you know, there's that, that, that famous saying that uh, a person's name is the sweetest sound in the world to, to them, no matter what the language. It's so to, to choose to engage them at the human level, just by starting by saying whatever their name is, uh, that is a great way to start that dialogue. You know, the first thing I thought about is actually Dr. Qualls does a really good job with this. So, <laughs> no, you, you, you speak with bravery and courage and truth and love, and you do a lot of great speaking, and you have a lot of things to say. And I've seen how some people who are avid fans respond, and I've seen how some people who have just want to cause trouble. And I have actually appreciated the way that you either engage if you can sense that they want to have a conversation, or you just say, no, thank you. Not on my space. And you do it so clearly without being mean. So I actually just felt like that was worth saying because it's something that we can all learn from. Well, thanks. I, you know, it's, it was disarming the first time you experienced something like that because your immediate response is to want to defend yourself. But you just learn after a while that your page or your space is yours and uh, not everybody gets invited in all the time. But it is, uh, I think if there's one thing I've learned over the years, it's, it's just how great relationships actually can be in this space. So many uh, places that I go today and, and, and conferences and church functions and things like that are, uh, people will say, you know, I follow you <laughs> on social media and you're like, oh good, I hope I said <laughs> nice things uh, today. But, but I, so I think for all the talk that we have about the diminishment of relationship, I think it is important to talk about the fact that, that there are relationships that are created. And I think for those of us who have public spheres uh, as part of our work, uh, I, I think we have to cultivate those spaces in that way. We don't get it right all the time, but, but we have to continue to do that. I think one of the other things that comes up, and I guess, Dr. Kim, I'll direct this to you, is for those of us who have very public lives, 
if we want to get published, if we want to have our work featured in uh, online spaces beyond our own, we are often asked, what is your platform? And we have to demonstrate that we have X number of followers, that we have so much engagement, and analytics is, is a part of that. And it can be really discouraging when you just wanna write that thing that is shut up in your bones and the numbers aren't where people need them to be. How would you encourage young scholars or young authors, people coming up in the field, to create good engagement, but also not become obsessed with that platform building? Such a good question. I think I see in that question just a passion to address a need in the world. That's usually where someone who wants to write a book has this, something's burning in their soul that they know they contribute and the world will be better because of it. And so I would say, start doing it. Do that on Twitter and on Instagram and on YouTube. Use all these channels because they are dynamic and beautiful and build that audience because you do have something the world needs. And it might not be the book right now, it might be in a year because you're contributing and you're creating and curating your space to be about that topic that's important, that's needed. And that will build the platform that publishers would be looking to see while it feeds your soul because you're addressing that unique space that God is calling you into using free channels. Well, we have a lot of questions that have come in and only time for just a couple of more. This is the way it works, right? The questions all come right at the end. But I, but I think this is a great question because I think sometimes um, when we start to talk about effective communication and good online engagement, the word civility gets tossed around without necessarily a good definition or perhaps uh, we just think if, if we were just nicer to one another, this would work out. But I think this is a really important question uh, because the, 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 the respondent online says, can't we talk about the, the need to be uncivil when presenting our Christian witness? Because the prophets in scripture were not always nice. Sometimes the message that they had to deliver was difficult and perhaps could have been seen as uncivil. So, so how do we speak prophetically uh, in, in the sense of speaking truth in, in these spaces uh, without um, also just being mean? Professor Andre, I'll, I'll start with you. Sure, yeah, that kind of nods back to uh, Professor's colleague question after my presentation. And it's such a good question because uh, if you read the prophets, they're not civil. I mean, they roll around in the dirt and they yell things at people in charge. And, and that is uh, hard work <laughs> and, and it's discouraging work. It disrupts the status quo. Why are they disrupting the status quo? I would say that, that, that the end is to direct the people's hearts towards God, to turn them back towards love. Um, and so that's why when the question was asked for me, um, is there ever a reason not to be civil or ever a, an excuse for incivility? Um, maybe we should be asking, you know, is there ever a reason not to love? And then we can uh, talk about how are we able to express love? Uh, and so I want to make space for incivility. <sighs> Ooh, and that's dangerous to say because that contradicts this whole conference. Yeah. But, but I want to make space for, for those who, um, who are responding to the injustices, incivilities, the, uh, the brokenness of um, devotion and, and righteousness that needs to be corrected and have to do so in, in creative ways. And I bet that their response is not as extreme as what they feel they're responding to. That was the case of, of Dr. King and the civil rights, was uh, everyone who looks at our movement, the marches, who looks at the sit-ins, who looks at uh, our rallies, they think we're being incivil, but we've got a long history of incivility that we wanna tell you about, and we need to talk about that. Um, theologian Wolf, in his book, Exclusion and Embrace, says that um, the oppressed have long memories. And so when we see a moment of incivility, that's why we need to train to ask, where did that come from? I, I was just going to say that I think we have to be careful to separate the difference between kindness and niceness, yes. you know, which is the, our president, Dr. Corey, wrote a whole book on it, which yes. is so good, um, cause, because there's a very marked difference. Mm -hmm. Kindness is sometimes discipline. Kindness is sometimes disruptive. 
Niceness is a whole different thing. So I think it's important to know anger can be with kindness. You can be angry and kind. You can, you can have very strong emotions and deep hurt. Part of civility is recognizing the other person's humanity and trying to say, I have a lot of thoughts and feelings about this, but let's talk about it. And so recognizing that, I think it was Dr. Muhlhoff earlier who said something like, don't hold me to this, but I think that I think, and willing, having the willingness to be messy. You can absolutely be messy and be civil. It's just an issue of not thinking of the other person as your opponent, but as someone to learn from. I think that's a really important distinction. I was gonna echo that same thing, because I, I would suggest and offer that civility is not the opposite of difficult, hard, or messy. It, and there's a lot of scholarship around what civility is, especially when we look at the public square. And some Christian scholars point out that civility outwardly is just a reflection of inward civility. Mm -hmm. And inward civility is your perspective of otherness and your perspective of their dignity. And so the pursuit of human flourishing, which is my personal non-academic definition of civility, our pursuit of their flourishing will mean we have hard conversations. Our pursuit of human flourishing will mean there may be sit-ins. Our pursuit of human flourishing may mean it gets messy, but I dignify you in the process and I hold that tension, which can be challenging. So one final thought from each of you. We called our conference Digital Hope as a means to think about uh, entering into this space with a positive perspective. So uh, Dr. Malloy, we'll start with you. What gives you hope for the digital space? Anytime there's an outlet to communicate, I get excited. I know I need to become a student of that outlet and try to figure out what does it mean to actually engage in that outlet. I think the hope is that there is a greater ability to reach others. There's a greater ability to have global community. There's a greater ability to learn more. I'm, I'm a nerd, I'm nerdy at heart, and I love the idea that we can send somebody something or someone will post something and we can easily share that. I love sharing, I love collaboration. I think there's so much good here. But like anything else, how can we possibly think we could handle it well without training, without thought, without education? And so my hope is that we can combine the possibilities with the responsibilities that are needed. Oh, I, I relate with Elizabeth Drescher who talks about these new technologies are actually inviting us into a ways of connecting, relating, and making meaning that were almost lost when we had one-way communication platforms. And so my hope is in the faith of things unseen, the restoration of connections that were broken because of the fall, families who are separated, friends who are separated, get this connection that we were designed for, and the capacity to have presence when physical geographical distance might mitigate that. So I, I really think that ability to relate and make meaning that we did not have before this technology is powerful and compelling. Mm, so good. I agree with both of those, and I love that. Um, and, and I would add to that my digital hope is in a God who chose to move beyond the intangible and incarnate among humans. And, and we can choose to be human <laughs> in this digital sphere and, and find ways to connect even as time and space collapse into instantaneous moments. I'm grateful for that. Well, thank you all so much for being present today and participating with us. Uh, I think you gave us each something to uh, chew on and to wrestle with, but also uh, encouraged us and gave us a space for hope. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your attendance in our conference today. I wanted to take just another minute to thank our sponsors for the conference today, the Communication Studies Department here at Biola University, the Winsome Conviction Project, and the School of Fine Arts and Communication. I don't know about you, but I have a lot to chew on and think about from all that we've heard today. You know, I have been a longtime user of social media. Back when MySpace first started, I wasted many hours of um, my master's degree program um, figuring out what song I wanted to play behind my MySpace page. And I think that there are so many benefits that can come from social media as well as many of the challenges that we've discussed today. But I want to leave you with a thought today. 
Saint Benedict, um, in his Rule for Monasteries, wrote that what he wanted the monks to do in the monasteries um, that were under his governance is that every time someone knocked at the door, he wanted the monks to take a moment and think about the fact that they were receiving that person knocking at the door as they would be receiving Jesus. And so as Christians who want to participate um, in the world of thought and ideas and culture and disseminate truth and share cute pictures of our babies and do all of those things, I would encourage all of us as we think about what to post, as we think about how to respond, and we think about how to participate, to remember that there is a person behind that computer, behind that smartphone or that tablet, and how can we receive them as Jesus would receive them? And how can we receive them as if we were receiving Christ into our own smartphone?